Chapter 73. Tessa. The next day, the weather is nice, with no snow and minimal slush on the sides of the road. When I get to Vance, Kimberly is sitting at her desk, and she smiles at me as I grab my usual donut and coffee. I didn't even know you came last night. I fell asleep, I tell her. I know, Smith was sleeping too. Thank you again, she says, and her phone rings. My office feels strange after being on campus yesterday. Sometimes it seems as though I live a double life, one half a college student, one half full adult. I have an apartment with my boyfriend and a paid internship that honestly feels like a job, not an internship. I love both halves, and if I had to choose, I would choose the adult life, but with Harden. I dive into my work, and lunchtime comes quickly. After several duds, I hit upon a manuscript that is really captivating, and I find myself eating quickly, so I can get back and finish it. I hope they find a cure for the main character's illness. I'll be heartbroken if he passes. The rest of the day goes quickly as I am completely withdrawn from the world and fully enveloped in the manuscript, which ends terribly sadly. With tears staining my cheeks, I leave for the day and head home. I haven't heard from Hardin once since I left him asleep and grumpy in bed, and I can't stop thinking about his words from last night. I need a distraction from ruminations. Sometimes I wish I could just shut my mind off the way other people seem to be able to do. I don't like that I overthink everything, but I can't help it. It's who I am, and now all I can think of is Hardin and me not having a future. Still, I really need to do something to get my mind off obsessing over this. He is who he is, and he doesn't want to ever get married or have children. Maybe I should call Steph after I go to Connors to get groceries and do a load of laundry since Harden and Landon will be going to the hockey game tonight God, I hope it goes well. When I arrive at the apartment, I find Harden reading in the bedroom. Hey, sexy. How was your day? He asks as I walk in. It was okay, I guess. What's wrong? Harden looks up at me. The manuscript I read today was so sad, incredible but so heartbreaking, I say, trying not to get emotional again. Oh, it must have been good, if you're still upset about it. He smiles. I would hate to have been there the first time you read A Farewell to Arms. I plop down next to him on the bed. This was worse, so much worse. He grabs hold of my shirt, pulling me to lay my head on his shoulder. My sensitive girl. As he runs his fingers up and down my spine, the way he spoke the words he just uttered makes my stomach flutter. To be called my girl in any form makes me much happier than it should. Did you even go to classes today? I ask him. Nope. Watching the mini human wore me out. By watching, you mean watching TV with him? Same thing. I did more than you did. So you like him, then? I'm not sure why I'm asking this. No well. As far as annoying children go, he isn't at the top of the list, but I won't be planning any playdate soon. He smiles. I roll my eyes, but don't say anything else about Smith. Are you ready for the game tonight? No, I already told him I'm not going. Harden. Do you have to go? I shriek. I'm teasing he'll be here soon. Do you owe me for this shit, Tess? Harden groans. Do you like hockey, though, and Landon is good company? Not as good of company as you. He kisses my cheek. You're in a good mood for someone who acts like they're being led to slaughter. If this goes badly, I won't be the one who is slaughtered. You better be nice to Landon tonight, I warn him. He raises his hands in mock innocence, but I know better. A knock is heard at the door, but Hardin stays put. He's your friend, you answer the door, he says. I give him a look, but go answer the door. Landon is dressed in a hockey jersey, blue jeans, and tennis shoes. Hey Tessa, he says with his usual friendly smile, and a hug for a greeting. Can we get this over with? Hardin says before I can even say hello. Well, I can see this will be a fun night. Landon jokes and runs a hand over his short hair. It'll be the best night of your entire life, Hardin teases him. Good luck, I tell Landon, who just chuckles. Oh, Tess. He's just showing off, trying to act like he isn't excited to spend time with me. Landon smiles, and it's Hardin's turn to roll his eyes. Well, this is too much testosterone for me, 
So I'm going to change and run some errands. Do you two have fun, I say, leaving the men to their little games. Chapter 74. Harden. As Landon and I push our way through the crowd, I groan and ask, why the hell is it so crowded already? He gives me a look with a little attitude behind it. Because you made us late. The game doesn't start for another 15 minutes. I usually come an hour early, he explains. Of course you do. Even when I'm not with Tessa, I'm with Tessa, I complain. Landon and Tessa are literally the same person when it comes to their annoying need to be the first and best at everything they do. You should feel honored to be with Tessa, he tells me. Stop being a dick, and we might actually enjoy the game, I tell him forcefully, but can't help the smile that appears on my face at his annoyance. Sorry Landon. I'm honored to be with her. Now, would you chill out? I laugh. Sure, sure. Let's just get our seats, he says quietly, leading the way. What the heck? Did you see that? How the heck did that count? Landon screams next to me. He's more energized than I've ever seen him. Still, even angry, he sounds like a pussy. Come on, he yells once more, and I bite my tongue in laughter. I suppose Tessa was right, he isn't too terrible of company. Not my first choice, obviously, but not so bad. I hear that the more you yell and scream, the more likely they are to win, I tell him. He ignores me, and continues to yell and boo with the ebb and flow of the game. I alternate between paying attention and texting Tessa dirty things, and before I realize it, Landon's yelling yes, when his team wins the game at the last second. The crowd piles out of the arena, and I push my way through them. Watch it, a voice behind me says. Sorry, Landon apologizes. That's what I thought, the voice says, and I turn around to find a nervous Landon and an asshole wearing the opposing team's jersey. Landon swallows but doesn't say anything else as the man and his crew continue to taunt him. Look how scared he is, another voice says, one of the asshole's friends, I presume. I, I Landon stammers. Are you kidding me? Fuck off, both of you, I snarl, and they both turn to look at me. Or what? I can smell the beer on the tall one's breath. Or I will shut you up in front of everyone, and you'll be so humiliated it'll be on the game's highlight reel. That's what, I warn him, meaning every single word. Come on, Dennis, let's go, the short one, the only one with some sense, says and tugs on his friend's jersey and they disappear into the crowd. I grab Landon by the arm and pull him the rest of the way. Tessa will have my balls if I let him get beat up tonight. Thanks for that, you didn't have to do it, Landon says when we reach his car. Don't make it awkward, okay? I grin, and he shakes his head, but I hear him laugh quietly to himself. Should I take you back to your apartment now? He asks after several minutes of awkward silence, while we wait to leave the crowded parking lot. Yeah, sure. I check my phone again to see if Tessa has responded. She hasn't. Are you moving? I ask Landon. I don't know yet. I really want to be closer to Dakota, he explains. So why doesn't she move here? Because her career in ballet wouldn't work here. She has to be in New York City. Landon lets another car pass in front of his, despite the fact that we've barely moved in the line of traffic since we left our parking spot and you are just going to give up your life and move for her? I scoff. Yeah, I would rather do that than continue to be away from her. I don't mind moving, anyway. New York City would be an awesome place to live. It's not always about one person in the relationship, you know, he says, looking sideways at me. Fucker. Was that supposed to be directed at me? Not exactly, but if you think it was, maybe it is. A group of drunken idiots stumbles in front of the car, but Landon doesn't seem to mind that they're blocking us. Shut the hell up, would you? I say. He's just being a dick now. Are you telling me you wouldn't move to New York to be with Tessa? Yes, that is exactly what I'm telling you. I don't want to live in New York, so I won't be living in New York. You know I don't mean New York, I mean Seattle. She wants to live in Seattle. She'll be moving to England with me, I tell him. I turn the volume dial on his radio up in hopes of ending this conversation. What if he doesn't? You know she doesn't want to, so why would you force her to? 
I'm not forcing her to do anything Landon. She will move, because we're supposed to be together, and she won't want to be away from me, simple as that. I check my phone once more to try to distract myself from the irritation my lovely stepbrother is causing me. You're an asshole. I shrug. Never claim that I wasn't. I dial Tessa's number and wait for her to answer. She doesn't. Great, fucking great. I hope she's still at home when I get there. If Landon didn't drive so goddamn slow, we would be there by now. I stay silent, picking at the torn skin surrounding my fingernails. After what seems like three fucking hours Landon pulls up in front of my apartment. Tonight wasn't so bad, right? He asks me as I get out of the car, and I chuckle. No, I guess it wasn't, I admit. Then I tease, if you tell anyone I just said that, I will kill you. Landon chuckles as he drives off. I let out a deep breath, very pleased that he didn't get his ass beat by those guys tonight. When I walk into the apartment, Tessa is sound asleep on the couch, so I just sit and watch her for a bit. Chapter 75. Harden. After watching Tessa sleep for a while, I gather her into my arms and carry her to our bedroom. She hugs onto my arms and rests her head against my chest. I gently lay her onto our bed and pull the covers up to her chest. I give her a soft kiss on the forehead and I'm about to turn and get myself ready for bed. When she says something, said, she mumbles. Did she just I stare at her, trying to replay the last three seconds in my mind? She didn't say Zed. She smiles, rolling onto her stomach. What the fuck? Part of me wants to wake her up and demand to know why she would call his name twice in her sleep. The rest of me, the paranoid and fucking fed up part of me, knows what she'd say. Tessa will tell me that I have nothing to worry about, that they're only friends, that she loves me. Some of that may be true, but she just said his name. Hearing that asshole's name fall from her lips on top of fucking Landon and his certainty about his future it's too much. I'm not certain of anything, not in the way he is, and Tessa obviously isn't sure about me either. Otherwise he wouldn't be dreaming of said. Grabbing paper and pen, I scribble out a note for her, leave it on the dresser, and head out into the night. I turn the car toward the Canal Street Tavern. I don't want to go there in case Nate and the group are still there, but there's a place close by where I used to drink all the time. Gotta love the state of Washington and the dumbasses that never ID college kids. Tessa's voice plays in my mind, warning me not to drink again after the last time, but I don't give a shit. I need a drink. I hear Zed and Landon's voices next. Why does everyone around me think their opinions matter to me? I'm not moving to Seattle, Landon and his shit advice can fuck off. Just because he wants to follow his girlfriend around doesn't mean that I want to. I can see it now, I pack my shit and move to Seattle with her, and two months later she decides she's had enough of my shit, and she leaves me. In Seattle, it'll be her world, not mine, and I could be pushed out of it just as easily as I was brought in. When I arrive at the bar, the music is low, and there aren't many people inside. A familiar blonde stands behind the bar, and looks at me with surprise, and interest, in her eyes. Long time, no see, Harden. Miss me? She grins and licks her full lips, remembering our nights together, I'm sure. Yeah, now give me a drink, I respond. Chapter 76. Tessa. When I wake up, Harden isn't in the bed. I assume he went for a coffee run, or he's in the shower, so I check the time on my phone and force myself out of bed. Despite not having gone out last night, I'm feeling pretty tired, so I don't really make an effort with my appearance, just pulling on a WCU t-shirt and jeans. I'm tempted to wear yoga pants, so I can tease Harden when I see him, but I can't find them anywhere. Knowing him, he probably hid them or put them somewhere so no other guys can see me in them. I look in my top drawer again, and when I close it, a piece of paper falls from the dresser. Went out with my dad for breakfast, it says in Hardin's handwriting. I'm equally confused and happy about this. I really hope Hardin and Ken can continue to build their relationship. Figuring that they're probably done, I try calling Hardin, but he doesn't answer. I shoot him a text message and head out to meet Landon at the coffee shop. When I get there, Landon is sitting at a table, 
and gestures to the two drinks in front of him. I already got yours, he says with a smile and lifts the paper cup to me. That was nice, thanks. The sweet yet bitter taste of the coffee wakes me up the rest of the way, but then I start getting anxious that I haven't heard back from Hardin. Look at us, looking like regular college students, Landon jokes, pointing at my shirt, and then at his, which is identical to mine. I laugh and take another drink of the blessed coffee. Hey, where's Hardin today? Landon grins. He didn't walk you to class this morning. I shrug. I don't know. He left me a note that he left early to have breakfast with his dad. Landon stops mid-drink and gives me a quizzical look. Really? Then after a moment, he nods and says, stranger things have happened, I guess. His response only makes my mind fill with doubt. Hardin did go to breakfast with his father. Didn't he? As Landon and I walk to class, and Hardin still hasn't responded to my previous or recent texts, an ache in my chest grows. When we take our seats, Landon looks at me and asks, are you okay, and I'm about to respond when I look up to see Professor Soto entering the room. Morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late, I had a late night last night. He smiles and shakes a leather jacket from his shoulders, before throwing it across the back of his chair. I hope everyone took the time to either purchase or steal a journal. Landon and I look at each other and pull out our journals. When I glance around, I see we're two of the only people to do so, and once again I'm amazed at just how unprepared college students are. But Professor Soto continues undeterred and absently straightens his tie. If not, take out a blank piece of paper, because we're going to use the first half of class to work on the first journal assignment. I haven't decided how many there will be exactly, but like I said, the journal will make up the majority of your grade, so you need to put in at least a little effort. He grins and sits, putting his feet on the desk. I want to know your ideas on faith. What does it mean to you? There is literally no wrong answer here, and your personal religion doesn't make a difference. You can take this in many different directions, do you yourself have faith in some higher power? Do you feel that faith can bring good things into people's lives? Maybe you think of faith in a completely different way altogether, does having faith in something or someone change the outcome of a situation? If you have faith that your unfaithful lover will stop being unfaithful, does that make a difference at all? Does having faith in God or a number of gods make you any better of a person than someone who doesn't? Take the topic of faith and do what you want with it just do something, he says. My mind is whirling with ideas. I used to go to church growing up, but I have to admit my relationship with God hasn't always been the strongest. Every time I try to press my pen to the first page of my journal, Hardin comes to mind. Why haven't I heard from him? He always calls. He left a note, so I know he's safe, but where is he now? How long will it be before I hear from him? As each text remains unanswered, the panic inside of me grows. He has changed so much, improved his behavior. Faith. Have I had too much faith in Hardin? If I continue to have faith in him, will he change? Before I realize where the time has gone, I'm on my third page. Most of what I've written has gone straight from somewhere inside of me to the paper, leaving my mind and heart out of it. Somehow a weight has been lifted by writing about my faith in Hardin. Professor Soto calls the end of class and I listened to Landon talk about his journal entry. He chose to write about faith in himself and his future. I wrote about Hardin without a thought. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. The rest of the day drags on miserably, since I haven't heard from Hardin. By one o'clock, I've called him three more times and sent eight more texts, but nothing. I feel bad about it, especially after having just written about faith and my feelings about him, but my first thought, is that I hope he isn't off doing something that will harm us. My second thought is of Molly. It's funny how she always pops up in mind when there's trouble. Well, not funny, but persistent. She's like an apparition that appears in my head, even though I know he wouldn't cheat on me. Chapter 77. Hardin. Do you want another cup of coffee? She asks. It'll help with. The hangover. No, I know how to get rid of a hangover. I've had plenty, I growl. Carly rolls her eyes. Don't be a dick. I was just asking. 
Stop talking. I rub my temples. Her voice is annoying as hell. Charming as ever, I see. She laughs and leaves me alone in her small kitchen. I'm a dumbass for even being here, but it's not like I had another option. Yes, I did, I'm just trying to not take the blame for my overreaction. I was harsh on Tessa, and said some pretty fucked up things, and now here I am in Carly's kitchen drinking fucking coffee this late in the afternoon. Do you need a ride back to your car? She yells from the other room. Obviously, I respond, and she walks into the kitchen wearing only a bra. You're lucky that I brought your drunk ass home with me. My boyfriend will be arriving soon, so we need to go. She slides her shirt over her head. You have a boyfriend? Nice. This keeps getting better. She rolls her eyes. Yes. I do. It may be surprising to you that not everyone just wants an endless parade of fuck buddies. I almost tell her about Tessa, but I decide against it, since it's none of her business. I gotta piss first, I tell her, and walk toward the bathroom. My head is pounding, and I'm angry at myself for coming here. I should be at home well, on campus. I hear my phone buzzing on the counter and snap back around. Don't you dare answer that, I bark at Carly, and she takes a step back. I'm not. Man, you weren't this big of an asshole last night, she remarks, but I ignore her. I follow Carly to her car, my head pounding with each step against the concrete. I shouldn't have drunk so much. I shouldn't have drunk at all. I look over at Carly as she rolls her window down and lights a cigarette. How could she ever have been my type? She's not wearing a seatbelt. She puts makeup on at stoplights. Tessa is so different from her, from any of the girls I've ever been with. As we're driving back to the bar, where I got shit-faced last night, I keep rereading the texts from Tessa, over and over again. This is terrible, she's probably really worried. My head's too foggy to think up a good excuse, so I just text her, I fell asleep in the car, after drinking too much with Landon last night. Be home soon. Something feels off, and I pause for a minute. But my whole brain is just rattled, so I hit send, and watch the phone, to see if she's replying. Nothing. Well, I can't tell her about this, about staying at Carly's house. She'll never forgive me, she won't even hear me out. I know she won't. I can tell she's getting tired of my shit lately. I know she is. I just don't have a fucking clue how to fix it. Carly interrupts my rumination, when she hits the brake and curses. Ah, uh, fuck. We have to go around, there's a wreck up there, she says, pointing to the cars blocking our way. Glancing up, I see a middle-aged man standing with his hands in his pockets, while talking to a police officer. He points to a white car, that looks just like I panic. Stop the car, I demand. What? Jesus, hard, I said stop the goddamn car. Without thinking, I open the door as the car comes to a stop, and rush over to the damaged cars. Where's the other driver? I ask the officer angrily, and look around the scene. The front end of the white car is badly damaged, and then I see the WCU parking pass hanging from the rearview mirror. Fuck. An ambulance is parked next to the police car. Fuck. If something happened to her, if he isn't okay where's the girl? Someone fucking answer me. I scream. The cop gets an aggressively annoyed look on his face, but the other driver sees my anxiety and says softly, there, and points to the ambulance. My heart stops beating. Wandering over in a daze, I see the ambulance doors are open, and Tessa is sitting on its back bumper, an ice pack on her cheek. Thank God. Thank God it's only small. I rush over to her, and the words start tumbling from my mouth. What happened? Are you okay? Relief takes over her features when she sees me. I had an accident. Above her eye is a small bandage, and her lip is swollen, and split on the side. Can you go? I ask rudely. Can she go? I ask a young EMT who's standing nearby. The woman nods and walks away quickly. I reach for Tessa's ice pack and move it, revealing a knot the size of a golf ball. Her cheeks are stained with tears, and her eyes are swollen and red. I can already see the black eye forming under her delicate skin. Fuck, are you okay? Was it his fault? I turn and try to find that asshole again. No, 
I ran into him, she says, wincing as she grabs the ice pack and puts it back on her skin. Then some of the relief leaves her eyes as she looks up at me and asks, where were you all day? What? I ask, honestly confused, between my hangover and seeing her like this. With a colder look in her eyes, she says, I said, Hardin, where were you all day? I snap back to the situation. Fuck. And right as I'm about to make an excuse, Carly walks up and smacks me on the ass. Well, Mr. Dark and Moody, can I go? You can walk back to your car from here, right? I really need to get back home. Tessa's eyes go wide. Who are you? Fuck. 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 Not this. Not now. Carly smiles and gives Tessa a little nod. I'm Hardin's friend Carly. Sorry about your accident. Then she looks at me. Can I go now? Bye, Carly, I snap. Wait, Tessa says. He was with you last night at your place? I try to make eye contact with her, but she continues to stare at Carly, who says, yeah, I was just trying to take him back to his car. His car? Where's that? She says, her voice shaking. Bye, Carly, I say again, and glare at her. Tessa stands up, though her knees buckle a little. No, tell me where his car is. I grab hold of her elbows in an attempt to stop her, but she pushes me away and then whimpers from the pain of the motion. Don't touch me, she says through her teeth. Carly. Where is his car? Tessa asks again. Carly raises her hands and looks back and forth between Tessa and me. At the bar where I work. Okay, I'm going now, she says and wanders off. Tessa I plead. God, why am I such a fuck up? Get away from me, she replies. Her cheek goes in a little. I can tell she's fighting down on it to keep her tears at bay. Now that she's standing here, staring off in the distance and trying to appear emotionless, I'm missing the days of her constant crying. Tessa, we have I begin, but my voice cracks. Now I'm the emotional one, and for once I don't care. The panic from seeing the front end of her car, smashed still courses through me, and I don't want anything other than to hold her right now. She still doesn't look at me. Go. Now. Or I'll tell the officer to make you. I don't give a fuck about them, her eyes whip back toward me with a vengeance. No, I'm done listening to you. I'm not sure what happened last night, but all morning I knew, somehow knew, you were with someone else. I was just trying to force myself not to believe it. We can work this out, I beg. We always have. Harden. Do you not see that I was just in an accident? She yells and starts crying, prompting the EMT to walk back over. Actually, you probably can't tell, your version of reality is so warped. You write me a note last night about going out with your dad this morning, then you text me that you fell asleep drunk in your car after drinking with Landon. With Landon? You. Must think I'm stupid enough to believe anything, even things that contradict each other. She glares at me. Of course, you're a walking bundle of contradictions, so, yeah, I can see how you might mistakenly think the rest of reality is too. The realization of just how stupid I was fills me, and I can't speak for a moment. I'm so stupid, so very very stupid. And not just because I couldn't keep my story straight. The EMT takes that moment to put a hand on Tessa's shoulder and says, is everything okay over here? We need to get you to the hospital, just to check everything out. Wiping her tears from her cheeks, Tessa looks dead at me and says to her, yes. I'm ready. I'm ready to leave now. Chapter 78. Harden. I crack open my fourth beer and spin the cap on the glossy wooden surface of our coffee table. When is she going to be here? Is he going to be here? Maybe I should just text her and tell her that I did have sex with Carly just to end both of our miseries. A loud knock on the door breaks me from my plotting. Here we go. I hope she's alone. I grab my beer, take another swig, and head for the door. The knocking quickly shifts to pounding, and I swing open the door to find Landon. Before I can react, his hands grip the collar of my t-shirt, and he slams me against the wall. What the fuck? He's much stronger than I ever expected, and I'm astounded by his aggressive behavior. What the hell is wrong with you, he yells. 
I didn't know his voice could even get that loud. Get the fuck off of me. I push back, but he doesn't move. Fuck, he's strong. He lets go of me, and for a second I think he's going to punch me, but he doesn't. I know that you slept with another girl, and you caused her to wreck her car. He gets in my face again. I suggest you lower your fucking voice, I snap. I'm not afraid of you, he says through his teeth. The alcohol makes me indignant, when I should be ashamed. I already beat your ass before, remember, I say as I go back to the couch and sit. Landon follows me. I wasn't as angry with you then as I am now. He lifts his chin higher. You can't just go around hurting her all the time. I wave him off. I didn't even sleep with that girl. I just slept over at her house, so mind your own damn business. Oh, wow. Of course you're drinking. He gestures at the empty beer bottles on the table, and the one in my hand. Tessa is all banged up, and has a concussion because of you, and here you are getting drunk. You're such a prick, he practically screams. That wasn't my fucking fault, and I tried to talk to her. Yes, it was your fault. It was your damn text message that she was trying to read when she crashed. The text that she knew right away was a lie, might I add. The breath is knocked out of me. What are you talking about? I choke. She was so anxious to hear from you all day, she grabbed her phone as soon as she saw your name. This is my fault. How did I not put it together? I caused these injuries to her. I hurt her. Landon continues to stare at me. She's done with you, you know that, don't you? I look up at him, suddenly weary. Yeah. I know. I reach for my beer. And you can leave now. But he snatches the bottle from my hand and walks into the kitchen. You're really fucking pushing it, I warn him and jump up. You're being an idiot, and you know it. You're here getting shit-faced while Tess is hurt, and you don't even care, he yells. Stop yelling at me. Fuck. I twist my fingers into my hair, tugging at the roots. I do care. But she isn't going to believe anything I say. Do you blame her? You should have just come home, or how about this, never left at all, he says and pours my beer down the drain. How can you be so uncaring? She loves you so much. He goes to the refrigerator and hands me a bottle of water. I'm not uncaring. I'm just sick of waiting for some shit to happen. You were babbling on and on about your fucking perfect love life and making sacrifices, blah, blah. Then Tess goes and says his damn name. I roll my head back, staring at the ceiling for a moment. Whose name, he asks. Said. She said his name in her sleep. Clear as day, like she wanted him to be there instead of me. In her sleep, he asks, and I can hear the sarcasm in his voice. Yes. Sleeping or not, she said his name instead of mine. He rolls his eyes. You do realize how ridiculous this sounds, don't you? Tessa said Zed's name, while she was sleeping, so you go out and get drunk? You're making a big deal out of this for no reason. The water bottle crunches and collapses in my hand from my grip. You don't even, I start, but then hear keys and the sound of the front lock turning and opening. I turn around, and see her come through the door. Tessa. And Zed. Zed next to her. I can't see straight as I get up and move toward them. What the fuck is this shit? I scream. Tessa takes a step back, stumbles, and catches herself on the wall behind her. Harden, stop, she yells at me. No. Fuck this. I'm sick of you coming around every time shit goes down. I say and shove my hands against Zed's chest. Stop it. Tessa yells again. Please, she says, then looks at Landon. What are you doing here, she asks him. I I came to talk to him. I nod sarcastically. Actually, he came here trying to fight me. Tessa's eyes nearly pop out of their sockets. What? I'll tell you later, Landon says. Zed is breathing hard, and he's staring at her. How could she bring him here after everything? Of course she'd go running to him. The man of her dreams. Tessa turns to Zed and puts a gentle hand on his shoulder. Thanks for bringing me home, Zed. I really appreciate it but it's probably best you go. He eyes me. Are you sure? He asks. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Landon's here, and I'll be going to his parents' place tonight. 
Zed nods in agreement, like he gets enough of a say to agree to anything, then turns and leaves. Tessa closes the door behind him. I can't control my anger as Tessa turns to me with a scowl on her face. I'm getting my clothes. She walks into the bedroom. I follow her, of course. Why did you call him for a ride? I shout behind her. Why did you go drinking with this Carly girl? Oh, wait, you were probably complaining how needy and full of expectations your girlfriend is, she snaps. Oh, let me guess how quick you were to unload to Zed about how fucked up I am, I growl back at her. No. I didn't tell him anything, actually. I'm sure he already knows it. Are you going to let me explain my side of this? I ask her. Sure, she remarks, attempting to pull her suitcase from the top shelf in the closet. I move to help her. Move, she snaps, obviously out of patience with my bullshit. I step back and let her get the case down. I shouldn't have left last night, I tell her. Really, she sarcastically says. Yes, really. I shouldn't have left and I shouldn't have drunk so much but I didn't cheat on you. I wouldn't do that. I only slept at her house because I was too drunk to drive that zit I. Explain. She crosses her arms and gets that classic mad girlfriend pose. Then why lie? I don't know, because I knew you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Well, cheaters usually don't admit when they cheat. I didn't cheat on you, I tell her. She sighs, obviously not convinced. It's really hard to believe you when you blatantly lie all the time. This time isn't any different. I know. I'm sorry for lying before, about everything, but I wouldn't cheat on you. I put my arms in the air. She neatly places a folded shirt in her suitcase. Like I said, cheaters don't admit they cheated. If you didn't have anything to hide, you wouldn't have lied. It's not that big of a deal, I didn't do anything with her, I say, defending myself as she adds another article of clothing. So what if I got wasted? and stay the night at Zed's house. What would you do? She asks me, and the thought nearly sends me over the edge. I'd fucking kill him. So it's not a big deal when you do it, only if it were me? She calls me out on my double standard. None of this even matters, you made it clear that I'm only temporary in your life, Tessa says. She walks out of the room and into the bathroom across the hall to get her toiletries. She really is going with Landon to my father's house. This is bullshit. She isn't temporary to me, how could she even think that? Probably because of all the shit I said to her last night and my lack of words today. You know I'm not going to let this go, I tell her when she zips her suitcase. Well, I'm leaving. Why? Do you know you'll be back? My anger speaks for me. That's exactly why I'm leaving, she says, her voice shaky as she grabs her suitcase and leaves the room without looking back. When I hear the front door slam shut, I lean my back against the wall and slide to the floor. Chapter 79. Tessa. Nine days. Nine days have gone by without a single word from Hardin. I didn't think it was possible for me to go a single day without speaking to him, let alone nine. It feels like 100, honestly, though each hour does hurt microscopically less than the prior one. It hasn't been easy, not even close to that. Ken made a call to Mr. Vance asking that I be allowed to take the rest of the week off, which only meant missing one day anyway. I know I'm the one who left, the one who walked away, but it kills me that he hasn't even tried to get in touch with me. I have always given more in the relationship, and this was his chance to show me how he truly feels. I guess in a way he's showing me, it's just that what he feels is the opposite of what I had desperately wanted. Needed. I know that Hardin loves me, I do. However, I also know that, if he loves me as much as I thought he did, he would have made it a point to show me by now. He said he wasn't going to let this go, but he did. He let it go, and he let me go. The part that scares me the most is that the first week I was walking around completely lost. I was lost without Hardin. Lost without his witty comments. Lost without his crude remarks. Lost without his assurance and his confidence. Lost without the way he'd sometimes draw circles on my hand while holding it between his, the way he'd kiss me for no reason and smile at me when he thought I wasn't looking. I don't want to be lost without him. I want to be strong. 
I want my days and nights to be just the same, whether I'm alone or not. I'm beginning to suspect I may always be alone, as dramatic as the thought seems. I wasn't happy with Noah, yet Hardin and I didn't work. Maybe I'm like my mother in that way. Maybe I'm better off alone. I didn't want it to be over this way, so cut and dried. I wanted to talk about everything, I wanted him to answer my calls, so we could come to some sort of agreement. I just needed space, I needed a break from him to show him that I'm not his doormat. It backfired on me, because he obviously doesn't care as much as I thought he did. Maybe this was his plan all along, get me to break up with him. I've known a few girls who go that route when leaving their boyfriends. During the first day I did expect a call, text, or hell, I really expected Hardin to come bursting through the door screaming at the top of his lungs and causing a scene, while his family and I sat in the dining room in silence, no one quite sure what to say to me. When that didn't happen, I lost it. Not crying in the corner, feeling sorry for myself lost it. I mean I lost myself. Every second I lived in anticipation of Hardin coming back to grovel for my forgiveness. I almost gave in that day. I almost went back to the apartment. I was ready to tell him to hell with marriage, I don't care if he lies to me every day and doesn't respect me as long as he never leaves me. Thankfully, I snapped out of that and salvaged some respect for myself. Day 3 was the worst. Day 3 was when the realization really began to hit me. Day 3 was when I finally spoke after three days of near silence, having only muttered a simple yes or no to Landon or Karen during their awkward attempts to engage me in conversation. The only sounds that actually came out were a strangled sob and a choppy explanation through tears of why my life would be better, easier, without him that even I didn't believe. Day 3 was when I finally looked in the mirror at my dirty and bruised face, my eyes swollen to the point of barely opening. Day 3 was when I fell to the floor, finally praying to God to make the pain disappear. No one can handle this pain, I told him. Not even me. Day 3 I called him, I couldn't help myself. I told myself that, if he answers we would work it out, and both come to a compromise, apologizing profusely and promising to never leave each other again. Instead, I got his voicemail after two rings, proving that he rejected the call. Day 4, I slipped and called him again. This time he had the courtesy to let it ring to voicemail instead of pressing ignore. Day 4 was when I realized how much more I actually care for him than he does me. Day 4 was when I spent the entire day in bed reliving the few times he actually told me how he felt about me. I began to realize that most of our relationship and how I portrayed his feelings for me in my mind was just that in my mind. I began to realize that while I was thinking we could do this, we could make this work forever, he wasn't thinking about me at all. That was the day I decided to join the ranks of normal teenagers and had Landon show me how to download music onto my phone. Once I started, I couldn't stop. Over 100 songs were added and headphones were put in my ears and barely removed for almost 24 hours. The music helps a lot. To hear about other people's pain reminds me that I'm not the only one to suffer in life. I'm not the only one who loved someone who didn't love them enough to fight for them. Day 5 was when I finally showered and attempted to go to class. I went to yoga, hoping that I could handle the memories it would evoke. I felt strange walking around in a sea of cheery college students. I used all the energy I had in hoping that I wouldn't run into Hardin on campus. I was past the stage of wanting him to call. I managed to drink half of my coffee that morning, and Landon told me that the color was coming back into my cheeks. No one seemed to notice me, and that was exactly what I wanted. Professor Soto assigned us to write down our biggest fears when it comes to life and how they relate to faith in God. Are you afraid to die? He asked us. Aren't I already dead? I answered silently. Day 6 was a Tuesday. I began to speak in sentences, broken sentences that usually didn't relate to the subject at hand, but no one had the heart to call me out on it. I returned to Vance. Kimberly couldn't meet my eyes for the first part of the day, but she finally attempted to have a conversation, which I couldn't bring myself to participate in. She mentioned a dinner 
and I reminded myself to ask her again, when I can think straight. The day was spent staring at the first page of a manuscript that, no matter how many times I read and reread it, wouldn't soak in. I ate that day, more than just the rice or a banana I had in the days before. Karen made a ham, I only noticed, because it reminded me, that she made one for the dinner Hardin and I had here in the beginning. The images from that night, the picture of him sitting next to me, and holding my hand under the table, sent me back into my tragic state, making me spend the night in the bathroom vomiting up the small bit of food I had consumed. As day seven dragged on I began to imagine what would happen, if I didn't have to feel this pain anymore. What if I just disappeared? The thought terrified me, not because of my death, but because my mind was capable of going to such a dark place. That thought snapped me out of my downward spiral, and brought me to the closest thing to reality my mind can handle. I changed my shirt and vowed to never step foot in Hardin's bedroom again, no matter what happened. I began to look up apartments that I could afford close to Vance and online classes at WCU. I enjoy academics too much to close myself off and take online classes, so I ultimately decided against it, but I found a few apartments to look into. Day 8 I smiled, briefly, but everyone noticed. Day 8 was the first morning that I grabbed my usual donut and coffee when I arrived at Vance. I kept it down and even went back for more. I saw Trevor, who told me I looked beautiful despite my wrinkled clothes and hollow eyes. Day 8 was the shift, day 8 was the first day that only half of my time was spent wishing that things had gone differently between Hardin and me. I heard Ken and Karen discussing Hardin's birthday in a few days, and I was surprised to only feel a slight burn in my chest at the sound of his name. Day 9 is today. I'll be downstairs. Landon calls through the door of my bedroom. No one has even mentioned me leaving, or where I would go if I did. I'm grateful for it, but at the same time I know my presence will eventually be a burden. Landon keeps assuring me that I can stay as long as I need to, and Karen reminds me how much she enjoys my company multiple times a day. But at the end of the day, they're Hardin's family. I want to make a move forward, decide where I should go and where I should live, and I'm no longer afraid. I cannot and refuse to spend another day crying over a dishonest boy with tattoos who doesn't love me anymore. When I see Landon downstairs, he's taking a large bite of a bagel. A dab of cream cheese rests in the corner of his mouth, and his tongue darts out to retrieve it. Morning. He smiles, his cheek full and eyes wide. Morning, I repeat and pour a glass of water. He continues to stare at me, while I sip my water. What? I finally ask him. You well you look great, he says. Thank you. I decided to shower and come back from the dead, I joke, and he smiles slowly, as if he's unsure about my mental state. Really, it's fine, I assure him, and he takes another bite of his bagel, finishing it. I decide to put one in the toaster for myself and try not to notice Landon staring at me like I'm an animal in a zoo. I'm ready whenever you are, I tell him, after finishing my breakfast. Tessa, you look so gorgeous today. Karen exclaims when she enters the kitchen. Thank you. I smile at her. Today's the first day that I've taken the time to get ready, really ready and presentable. The last eight days I have gone far away from my usual neat appearance. Today I feel like myself. My new self. My after heart and self. Day nine is my day. That dress is flattering. Karen compliments me again. The yellow dress. That Trish got me for Christmas fits well, and it's very casual. I'm not going to make the same mistake as last time and attempt to wear heels to classes, so my toms it is. Half of my hair is pinned back, with a few loose curls tapering over my face. My makeup is subtle, but I think it suits me well. My eyes burn slightly as I drag the brown liner underneath my eye makeup surely wasn't on my list of priorities during my downward spiral. Thank you so much. I smile again. Have a great day. Karen smiles, clearly surprised but very pleased at my return to the real world. This must be what it's like to have a caring mother, someone to send you off to school with kind and encouraging words. Someone unlike my mother. My mother I have dodged all calls from her, and thankfully so. 
She was the last person I wanted to speak to, but now that I can breathe without wanting to rip my heart from my chest, I actually want to call her. Oh, Tessa, will you be riding with us to Christian's house on Sunday? Karen asks just as I reach the door. Sunday? The dinner they're having to celebrate their move to Seattle, she tells me, as if I should know this already. Kimberly said she told you about it? If you don't want to go, I know they'll understand, she assures me. No, no. I want to go. I'll ride with you. I smile. I am ready for this. I can be in public, in a social setting, without cracking. My subconscious is mute for the first time in nine days, and I thank her, before following Landon outside. The weather mirrors my mood, sunny and somewhat warm for the end of January. Are you going on Sunday? I ask him once we get in the car. No, I'm leaving tonight, remember, he replies. What? He looks at me with a wrinkled brow. I'm going to New York for the weekend. Dakota is moving into her apartment there. I told you a few days ago. I'm so sorry, I should have paid more attention to you instead of making it all about me, I tell him. I can't believe how selfish I'd been to, not even pay attention to him telling me about Dakota's move to New York. No, it's okay. I only briefly mentioned it, anyway. I didn't want to rub it in your face when you were well, you know. A zombie? I finish for him. Yes, a very scary zombie, he jokes, and I smile for the fifth time in nine days. It feels nice. When will you be back? I ask Landon. Monday morning. I'll miss religion, but I'll be there right after. Wow, that's exciting. New York will be incredible. I would love to escape, to get out of here for a while. I was worried about going and leaving you here he tells me, and guilt fills me. Don't be. You already do way too much for me, it's time I do things for myself. I don't want you to ever think about not doing something for yourself because of me. I'm so sorry that I made you feel that way I tell him. It's not your fault, it's his he reminds me, and I nod. My headphones go back into my ears, and Landon smiles. In religion, Professor Soto chooses the subject of pain. For a moment I swear he's done it on my behalf, to torture me, but when I begin to write about how pain can cause people to turn to or away from their faith in God, I'm thankful for this torture. My entry ends up being filled with thoughts about how pain can change you, how pain can make you much stronger, and in the end you don't need faith as much. You need yourself. You need to be strong and not allow pain to push you or pull you into anything. I end up going back to the coffee house before yoga to acquire more energy. On my way back to yoga I pass the environmental studies building and my mind goes to Zed. I wonder if he's in there now. I assume he is, but I don't have a clue about his schedule. Before I can overthink it, I go inside. I have a little time before my class begins and it's less than a five-minute walk from here. I look around the large lobby of the building. Just like I might have expected, large trees fill most of the massive space. Sticking to the theme, the ceiling is mostly skylights, giving the illusion that it's almost non-existent. Tessa? I turn, and indeed, there is said, wearing a lab coat and thick. Safety goggles on top of his head that push his hair back. Hey I say. He smiles. What are you doing in here? Did you change your major? I adore the way his tongue hides behind his teeth when he smiles, I always have. I was looking for you, actually. You were. He seems astounded. Chapter 80. Harden. Nine days. Nine days have gone by without speaking to Tessa. I didn't think it was possible for me to go a single day without speaking to her, let alone nine fucking days. It feels like 1,000, and each hour is more painful than the last. When she left the apartment that night, I waited and waited to hear her footsteps rush through the door, and I waited for her voice to begin screaming at me. It didn't come. I sat on the floor waiting and waiting. It never came. She never came. I finished the beer in my fridge and smashed the evidence against the wall. The next morning when I woke up and she was still gone, I packed my shit. I got on a plane to get the fuck out of Washington. If he was going to come back, it would have been that night. I needed to get out of there and get some space. With alcohol on my breath and stains on my white t-shirt, 
I left for the airport. I didn't call my mom before I got there. It's not like she had anything going on anyway. If Tessa calls me before I get on the flight, I'll turn around. But if not, then too bad, I kept thinking. She had her chance to come back to me. She does every other time, no matter what I do, so why is this time so different? It's not like I did anything, really. I lied to her, but it was a small-ass lie and she overreacted. If anyone should be pissed off, it's me. She brought said to my fucking house. On top of that, Landon comes barging in like the fucking Hulk and slams me into the wall. What the actual fuck? This whole situation is utterly fucked up and it's not my fault. Well, maybe it is, but she can come crawling back to me, not the other way around. I love her, but I'm not making the first move. Day one was spent mostly on the airplane sleeping off my hangover. I got many dirty looks from snobby ass flight attendants and assholes and business suits, but I could give a fuck less. They don't mean shit to me. I took a cab to my mum's and nearly choked the driver. Who charges that much for a fucking 10 mile cab ride? My mum was shocked and happy to see me. She cried for a few minutes, but thankfully she stopped when Mike appeared. Apparently the two of them have begun to move her things into his house and she plans on selling hers. I don't give a shit about that house, so it's no skin off my back. That place is full of shit memories with my drunk asshole of a dad. It's nice to be able to think these things without Tess's influence. I would feel slightly guilty being rude to my mum and her boyfriend if Tessa were here with me. So thank God she isn't. Day two was exhausting as shit. I spent the entire afternoon listening to my mum talk about her plans for the summer and dodged her questions about why I'm home. I kept telling her, if I wanted to talk about it I would. I came here for some goddamn peace, and all I get is more annoyance. I ended up at the pub down the street by 8. A pretty brunette with the same color eyes as Tessa smiled at me and offered me a drink that night. I declined somewhat politely, my kindness only coming out because of the color of her eyes. The longer I stared at them, the more I realized they weren't the same as Tessa's. They were dull and held no life behind them. Tessa's eyes are the most intriguing shade of gray that appears blue at first glance until you really look at them. They're nice, as far as eyes go. Why the fuck am I sitting at a pub thinking about eyeballs? Fuck. I saw the disappointment in my mum's eyes when I stumbled through the door after two in the morning, but I did my best to ignore it, mumbling a shit apology before forcing my way up the stairs. Day three was when it started. Small thoughts of Tessa kept sneaking in at the most random times. While watching my mum hand wash the dishes, I thought of Tessa loading the dishwasher constantly, making sure there was never a single dirty dish lying in the sink. We're going to the fair today. Would you like to come? My mum asked. No. Please, Hardin, you're here visiting, and you've barely spoken to me or spent any time with me. No mum. I dismiss her. I know why you're here, she said softly. I slammed my cup down on the table and stormed out of the kitchen. I knew she would catch on that I was running, hiding really, from reality. I'm not sure what type of reality there is without Tessa, but I'm not ready to deal with the shit, so why does she have to pester me about it? If Tessa doesn't want to be with me, then to hell with her. I don't need her, I am better off alone, the way I had planned to be all along. Seconds later my phone rang, but I ignored the call, as soon as I saw her name. Why did she call me? To tell me she hates me, or she needs her name off the lease, I was sure. God damn it, Hardin, why did you do that? I kept asking myself. I didn't have a good enough answer. Day 4 began the worst way possible. Hardin, go upstairs, she's begging. No, not this again. One of the men slaps her across her face and she looks at the staircase, her eyes meet mine and I scream. Tessa. Hardin. Wake up, Hardin. Please wake up, my mum screamed and shook me awake. Where is she? Where's Tess? I choked, sweat soaking my skin. She isn't here, Hardin. But they took me a moment to collect my thoughts and realize it was only a nightmare. The same nightmare I've had my entire life, only this time it was so much worse. My mother's face was replaced with Tessa's. 
SHHH it's okay. It was only a dream. My mom cried and tried to hug me, but I gently pushed her arms back. No, I'm fine, I assured her, and told her to leave me alone. I lay awake for the rest of the night trying to get the image out of my head, but I couldn't. Day 4 continued just as it started. My mom ignored me all day, which I thought I would want, but it turned out I was sort of lonely. I began to miss Tessa. I kept finding myself looking next to me to talk to her, to wait for her to say something that was sure to make me smile. I wanted to call her, my finger traced over that green button over 100 times, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I can't give her what she wants, and that isn't going to be good enough for her. It's better this way. I spent the afternoon looking up how much it would cost me to move my ship back here to England. This is where I'm going to end up anyway, so I might as well get it over with. We would never work, Tessa and me. I always knew we wouldn't last. We couldn't. It wasn't possible for us to be together always. She's too damn good for me, and I know it. Everyone knows it. I see the way people turn to stare at us everywhere we go, and I know they're wondering why that beautiful girl is with me. I had been staring at my phone, while downing a half bottle of whiskey for hours, before I turned off the light and fell asleep. I thought I heard the buzzing of my phone on the nightstand, but I was too drunk to sit up and answer. The nightmare came again. This time Tessa's nightgown was soaked in blood and she cried for me to go away, to leave her there on that couch. Day 5 I woke up to a flashing red light on my phone indicating that yet again I'd missed her call, only this time it wasn't intentional. Day 5 was when I stared at her name on the screen, before looking at picture after picture of her. When did I take so many? I hadn't realized how many pictures I had snapped without her paying any mind. While looking through the pictures, I kept remembering the way her voice sounds. I never liked American accents, they bore me and they're annoying, but Tessa's voice is perfect. Her accent is perfect, and I could listen to her speak all day, every single day. Will I ever hear her voice again? This one's my favorite, I thought at least 10 times, while looking through the photos. I finally settled on a picture of her lying on her stomach on the bed, her legs crossed in the air and her hair down, tucked behind her ear. She had her chin resting on one of her hands, and her lips slightly parted as she took in the words in front of her on the screen of her e-reader. I snapped the picture the moment she caught me staring, the exact moment that a smile, the most beautiful smile, appeared on her face. She looked so happy to be looking at me in this picture. Does well, did she always look at me that way? That day, day 5, was when the weight appeared on my chest. A constant reminder of what I'd done, and most likely lost. I should have called her that day, while staring at her pictures. Did she stare at my pictures? She only has one to this day, and ironically I found myself wishing I'd have allowed her to take more. Day 5 was when I threw my phone against the wall in hopes of smashing it, but only cracked the screen. Day 5 was when I desperately wished she would call me. If she called me, then it would be okay, everything would be okay. We'd both apologize, and I'd go home. If she was the one to call me, then I wouldn't feel guilty for coming back into her life. I wondered if she was feeling the same way I was. Was every day getting harder for her? Did every second without me make it harder for her to breathe? I began to lose my appetite that day. I just wasn't hungry. I missed her cooking, even the simple meals that she would make for me. Hell, I missed watching her eat. I missed every goddamn thing about that infuriating girl with kind eyes. Day 5 was when I finally broke down. I cried like a bitch and didn't even feel bad about it. I cried and cried. I couldn't stop. I tried desperately, but she wouldn't leave my mind. She wouldn't leave me alone. She kept appearing, she kept saying she loved me, and she kept hugging me, and when I realized it was my imagination, I cried again. Day 6 I woke with swollen and bloodshot eyes. I couldn't believe the way I'd broken down the previous night. The weight on my chest had magnified, and I could barely see straight. Why was I such a fuck-up? Why did I continue to treat her like shit? She's the first person who has ever been able to see me, inside of me, the real me, and I treated her like shit. I blamed her for everything, when in reality it was me. It was always me, even when I didn't seem to be doing anything wrong, I was. I was rude to her, 
when she tried to talk to me about things. I yelled at her when she called me out on my bullshit. And I lied to her repeatedly. She has forgiven me for everything, always. I could always count on that, and maybe that's why I treated her the way I did, because I knew I could. I smashed my phone under my boot on day 6. I went half the day without eating. My mom offered me oatmeal, but when I tried to force myself to eat it, it nearly came back up. I hadn't showered since day 3, and I was a fucking wreck. I tried to listen as my mom told me the few things she needed me to get from the store, but I couldn't hear her. All I could think of was Tessa and her need to go to Connor's at least five days a week. Tessa once told me I ruined her. Now, as I sit here trying to focus, trying to just catch my breath, I know that she was wrong. She ruined me. She got inside me and fucked me up. I had spent years building those walls, my entire life, really, and here she came in and tore them down, leaving me with nothing but rubble. Did you hear me, Hardin? I made a small list in case you didn't, my mum said, handing me the frilly piece of stationery. Yes. My voice was barely audible. Are you sure you're okay to go, she asked. Yeah, I'm good. I stood up and tucked the list into my dirty jeans. I heard you last night, Hardin, if you want to, don't, mum. Please don't. I nearly choked on my words. My mouth was so dry and my throat was aching. Okay. Her eyes were full of sadness as I walked out of the house to head to the store just down the road. The list only consisted of a few items, yet I couldn't remember any of them without digging the damn paper out of my pocket. I managed to corral the few things, bread, jam, coffee beans, and some fruit. Looking at all the food in the store made my empty stomach turn. I took an apple for myself and began to force myself to eat it. It tasted like cardboard and I could feel the small pieces hitting the pit of my stomach as I paid the elderly woman at the cash register. I walked outside, and it began to snow. The snow made me think of her too. Everything made me think of her. My head was aching with a headache that refused to go away. I rubbed my fingers over my temples with my free hand and crossed the street. Hardin? Hardin Scott? A voice called from the other side of the street. No. It couldn't be. Is it you? She asked again. Natalie. This couldn't be happening. I kept thinking as she walked toward me with her hands full of shopping bags. Erm hey, was all I could say, my mind frantic, my palms already beginning to sweat. I thought you moved, she asked. Her eyes were bright, not lifeless like I remembered as she cried and begged for me to let her stay at my house when she had nowhere to go. I did I'm only visiting, I told her and she set her bags on the sidewalk. Well, that's good. She smiled. How could she be smiling at me, after what I had done to her? Ah uh, yeah. How are you? I forced myself to ask the girl whose life I ruined. I'm good, really good, she chirped and ran her hands over her swollen belly. Swollen belly? Oh god. No, way the timeline didn't add up. Holy shit, that scared me for a second. You're pregnant? I asked, hoping that she was so I hadn't just insulted her. Yeah, six months along. And engaged. She smiled again, holding her small hand up to show me a gold ring on her finger. Oh. Yeah, it's funny how things work out, isn't it? She tucked her brown hair behind her ear and looked into my eyes, which were circled with blue rings from lack of sleep. Her voice was so sweet that it made me feel a thousand times worse. I couldn't stop picturing her face as she caught all of us watching her on the small screen. She'd screamed, literally screamed, and ran from the room. I didn't follow her, of course. I just laughed at her, laughed at her humiliation and her pain. I'm really sorry, I blurted. It was strange, weird, and necessary. I expected her to call me names, to tell me how fucked up of a person I am, to punch me, even. What I didn't expect was for her to wrap her arms around me and tell me she forgave me. How can you forgive me? I was so fucked up. I ruined your life, I said. My eyes were burning. No, you didn't. Well, you did at first, but in a way, it all worked out in the end, she said, and I nearly vomited on her green sweater. What? After you well, you know I had nowhere to go, so I found a church 
a new church since mine exiled me, and that's where I met Elijah. Her face instantly lit up at the mention of his name. And now here we are nearly three years later, engaged and expecting. Everything happens for a reason, I guess? Sounds cheesy, huh? She giggled. The sound reminded me that she was always such a sweet girl. I just hadn't given a shit. Her kindness made it easier to prey on her. I suppose it does, but I'm really glad you found someone. I've been thinking about you lately you know what I did, and I felt like shit about it. I know you're happy now, but that doesn't excuse what I did to you. It wasn't until Tessa that I, I cut myself off. A little smile tweaked her lips. Tessa? I nearly passed out from the pain. She's, um well she's I stutter. She's what? Your wife? Natalie's words cut straight to the core as her eyes searched my fingers for a band. No, she was she was my girlfriend. Oh. So you date now? She half teased. She could sense my pain, I was sure. No well, only her. I see. And now she's not your girlfriend anymore? Nope. I brought my fingers to my lip ring. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope things work out for you, the way they have for me, she said. Thank you. Congratulations on the engagement and baby, I said uncomfortably. Thank you. We expect to marry this summer. So soon? Well, we've been engaged for two years. She laughed. Wow. It was fast, soon after we met, Natalie explained. I felt like an asshole as soon as the words left my mouth, but I asked, aren't you too young? But she just smiled. I'm nearly 21, and it doesn't make sense to wait. I've been fortunate enough to find the person I want to spend my life with at a young age, why waste any more time when he's right in front of me asking that I do just that. I'm honored that he wants to make me his wife, there's no greater expression of love than that. As she explained, I could hear Tessa's voice saying the words instead. I guess you're right, I told her and she smiled. Oh, there he is. I have to go, I'm freezing and pregnant, not a good combination. She laughed before picking her bags up off the sidewalk and greeting a man in a sweater vest and khakis. His smile when seeing his pregnant fiancé was so bright that I swore it lit up that dreary day in England. Day 7 was long. Every day has been long. I kept thinking of Natalie and her forgiveness. It couldn't have come at a better time. Sure, I look like hell and she knew it, but she was happy and in love. Pregnant, at that. I didn't ruin her life the way I thought I had. And I thank God for that. I spent the whole day in bed. I couldn't even bring myself to open the damned blinds. My mum and Mike were out all day, so I was left alone to sulk in my misery. Each day got worse. I constantly thought about what she was doing, who she was with. Was he crying? Was she lonely? Had she returned to her apartment to find me? Why hadn't she called me again? This isn't the pain I had read about in novels. This pain isn't just in my mind, this pain isn't physical. This is a soul-aching pain, something that is ripping me apart from the inside out, and I don't think I can survive it. No one could. This must be how Tessa feels when I hurt her. I can't imagine her fragile body withstanding this type of pain, but clearly she's stronger than she appears. She has to be, to put up with me. Her mum once told me that, if I really cared about her, I would leave her alone. I would hurt her anyway, she said. She was right. I should have left her alone then. I should have left her alone from that first day she walked into that dorm room. I promised myself that I would rather die than hurt her again this is what this is. This is dying, this is worse than dying. It hurts worse. It has to. I spent AA drinking, the entire day. I couldn't stop. With each drink I prayed that her face would leave my mind, but it wouldn't. It couldn't. You have to get your shit together, Harden. You have to. I have to. I really do. Harden Tess's voice sends chills down my spine. Babe she says. When I look up at her, She's sitting on my mum's couch with a smile on her face and a book in her lap. Come here please, she whines as the door opens and a group of men step inside. No. There she is, says the short man who torments my dreams each night. Pardon? Tessa begins to cry. Get away from her, I warn them as they close in on her. 
They don't seem to hear me. Her nightgown is ripped off as she's thrown to the floor. Wrinkled and dirt-stained hands travel up her thighs as she whimpers my name. Please harden, help me. She looks to me, but I'm frozen. I am immobile and unable to help her. I am forced to watch as they beat her and violate her until she's lying on the floor silent and bloodied. My mum didn't wake me, no one did. I had to finish it, all of it, and when I woke up my reality was worse than any nightmare. Day 9 is today. Did you hear about Christian Vance moving to Seattle? My mum asks me as I push the cereal around the bowl in front of me. Yeah. That's exciting, isn't it? A new branch in Seattle. I suppose it is. He's having a dinner party on Sunday. He thought you'd be there. How do you know? I ask her. He told me, we talk from time to time. She looks away and refills her coffee mug. What for? Because we can, now eat your cereal. She scolds me like a child, but I don't have the energy to come up with a snappy remark. I don't want to go, I tell her, and force the spoon to my mouth. You may not see him again for a while. So? I barely see him now anyway. She looks as if she has something else to say, but she keeps quiet. Have you got any aspirin? I ask, and she nods, before disappearing to retrieve some. I don't want to go to a stupid fucking dinner party celebrating Christian and Kimberly leaving for Seattle. I'm tired of everyone always talking about Seattle, and I know Tessa will be there. The pain of the idea of seeing her tackles me and nearly knocks me out of the chair. I have to stay away from her, I owe it to her. If I can stay here for a few more days, weeks even, we can both move on. She'll find someone like Natalie's fiancé, someone much better for her than me. I still think you should go, my mum says again as I swallow the aspirin, knowing they won't help. I can't go, mum even if I wanted to. I would have to leave first thing in the morning, and I'm not ready to leave. Do you mean you aren't ready to face what you left, she says. I can't hold it in any longer. I bury my face in my hands as I let the pain take over, I let it drown me. I welcome it, and hope it kills me. Heart in my mum's voice is quiet and comforting as she hugs me, and I shake in her arms. Chapter 81. Tessa. The moment Karen leaves to take land into the airport, I instantly feel it. I feel the loneliness creeping in, but I have to ignore it. I have to. I'm fine by myself. I walk downstairs to the kitchen after my stomach's refusal to stop growling reminds me how hungry I am. Ken is leaning against the kitchen counter, tearing back the foil wrapper on a light blue frosted cupcake. Hey Tessa. He smiles, taking a small bite. Grab one. My grandmother used to tell me that cupcakes are food for the soul. If I need anything, it's something for my soul. Thank you. I smile before licking a stripe across the top. Don't thank me, thank Karen. I will. This cupcake tastes incredible. Maybe it's because I've barely eaten in the last nine days, or maybe it's because cupcakes truly are good for the soul. Regardless of the reason, I finish it in less than two minutes. After the glow of the treat washes away, I can feel that the pain is still present, steady as my heartbeat. But it's no longer overwhelming me, no longer pulling me under. Ken surprises me by saying, it'll get easier, and you'll find someone who is capable of loving another person besides themselves. My stomach churns from his sudden subject change. I don't want to backtrack, I want to move forward. I treated Hardin's mum terribly. I know I did. I would leave for days at a time, I would lie, I would drink until I couldn't see straight. If it weren't for Christian, I don't know how Trish and Hardin would ever have made it through with his words. I remember my anger toward Ken when I heard about the origin of Hardin's nightmares. I remember wanting to slap him right across his face for ever letting anything hurt his son in that way, so when he says this, it stirs my stored anger. I ball my fists. I will never be able to take any of that back, no matter how hard I wish that I could. I wasn't good for her, and I knew it. She was too good for me, and I knew that too. So did everyone else. Now she has Mike who I know, will treat her the way she deserves to be treated. There's a mic for you too, I know it, he says, looking at me in a fatherly way. My son hopefully will be lucky enough to find his Karen later in life, 
when he grows up and stops fighting everything and everyone along the way. At the mention of Hardin with his Karen, I swallow and look away. I don't want to imagine Hardin with anyone else. It's way too soon. I do wish that for him, though. I would never wish for him to be alone for the rest of his life. I just hope he finds someone who he loves as much as Ken loves Karen, so that he can have a second chance to love someone more than he loved me. I hope he does too, I finally say. I'm sorry that he hasn't contacted you, Ken says quietly. It's okay I stopped expecting it a few days ago. Anyway, he says with a sigh, I better get upstairs to my office. I have some phone calls to make. I'm glad he's excusing himself, before we get any deeper into the conversation. I don't want to talk about Hardin anymore. When I pull up in front of Zed's apartment building, he's waiting outside with a cigarette behind his ear. You smoke? I ask and crinkle my nose. He seems puzzled as he climbs into my small car. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes. And you saw me smoke that night at the frat house, remember? He pulls the cigarette from behind his ear and smiles. I found this one in my room. I laugh a little. Yeah, after the beer pong and Hardin yelling at us that night, I guess the smoking thing slipped my mind. I give him a smile, but then realize something. But wait, so not only do you plan to smoke, you plan to smoke an old cigarette? I guess so. You don't like cigarettes? No, not at all. But hey, if you want to smoke, you can. Well, not in my car, obviously, I say. His fingers move to the door, and he presses one of the small buttons. When the window is half down, he tosses the cigarette out the window. Then I won't smoke. He smiles and rolls it back up. As much as I despise the habit, I have to admit there was something about the way he looked with his hair styled nearly straight up, his dark sunglasses, and his leather jacket that made that cigarette look stylish. Chapter 82. Hardin. Here you go, my mum says when she walks into my old bedroom. She hands me a small porcelain cup on a saucer, and I sit up from the bed. What is it? I ask, my voice hoarse. Warm milk and honey, she says as I take a sip. Remember when you were little, and I used to make it when you were sick? Yeah. She'll forgive you, Hardin, she tells me, and I close my eyes. I finally moved on from sobbing to dry heaving to numbness. That's all it is, is numb. I don't think so she will, I saw the way she looked at you. She's forgiven you for much worse, remember? She brushes the matted hair away from my forehead, and I don't flinch away for once. I know, but this time isn't like that, mum. I ruined everything that I spent months building with her. She loves you. I can't do it anymore, I can't. I can't be who she wants me to be. I always fuck everything up. That's who I am, and always will be, the guy who fucks everything up. That's not true, and I happen to know that you're exactly what she wants. The cup shakes in my hand, and I nearly drop it. I know you're only trying to help, but, please just stop, mum. So what, then? You're just going to let her go and move on? I set the cup down on the side table before answering. I sigh. No, I couldn't move on, if I wanted to, but she has to. I have to let her move on before I do any more damage. I have to let her end up like Natalie. Happy happy after everything I did to her. Happy with someone like Elijah. Fine, Hardin. I don't know what else to say to convince you to step up and apologize, she snaps. Just go. Please, I beg. I will. But only because I have faith in you that you'll do the right thing and fight for her. The small cup and platter are thrown against the wall and shattered into small pieces, as soon as she closes the door behind her. Chapter 83. Tessa. After we have lunch at a little nondescript strip mall, we head back towards Zed's place. As we pass the campus, I finally have the courage to ask him the question I've always wanted to ask. Zed, what do you think would have happened if you had won? He's clearly caught by surprise, but he recovers, after looking at his hands for a minute. I don't know. I've thought about it a lot. You have? I look at him, and his caramel eyes meet mine. Of course I have. What did you come up with? I tuck my hair behind my ear, waiting for his answer. Well I know I would have told you about it, 
before I let it get that far. I always wanted to tell you. Every time I saw the two of you together, I wanted you to know. He gulps. You have to know that. I do know it, I barely whisper, and he continues. I like to think that you could have forgiven me, since I would have told you before anything happened, and we'd have gone out on dates, proper dates. Like the movies or something, and we would have had fun. You would have smiled and laughed, and I wouldn't have taken advantage of you. And I like to think that you'd eventually have fallen for me, the way you did for him, and when it was right we would have, and I wouldn't have told anyone. I wouldn't have given anyone a single detail about it. Hell, I wouldn't have even hung around any of them anymore, because I'd have wanted to spend every second with you, making you giggle the way you do, when you think something is really funny it's different from your regular laugh. That's how I know when I'm really entertaining you, or you're faking it to be polite. He smiles, and my heart begins to race. And I would have appreciated you, and not lied to you. I wouldn't have mocked you behind your back, or called you names. I wouldn't have cared about my reputation and, and I think we could have been happy. You could have been happy, all the time, not just sometimes. I'd like to think, I cut him off by grabbing the collar of his jacket, and bringing my lips to his. Chapter 84. Tessa. Zed's hand immediately moves to my cheek, causing the skin on the back of my neck to rise, and he pulls my arm, to bring me to him. I hit my knee on the steering wheel as I climb across, and mentally curse at myself for nearly ruining the moment, but he doesn't seem to notice, and wraps his arms around my back, bringing me flush against his chest. My arms latch around his neck, and our mouths move in sync. His mouth is foreign to me, it's not like Hardin's. His tongue doesn't move the same, it doesn't trace mine, and he doesn't trap my bottom lip between his teeth. Stop it, Tessa. You need this, you need to stop thinking about Hardin. He's surely in bed with some random girl, Molly even. Oh God, if he's with Molly you could have been happy all the time, not just sometimes, Zed just said. I know he's right, I would have been much better off with him. I deserve this. I deserve to be happy. I've suffered enough, and dealt with enough of Hardin's bullshit, and he hasn't even tried to talk to me about it. Only a weak person would run back to someone who has trampled on them repeatedly. I can't be that weak, I have to be strong and move on. Or try at least. I feel better right now, in this moment, than I felt in the last nine days. Nine days doesn't sound like a long time until you spend it counting every single second of misery waiting for something that doesn't come. With Zed's arms around me, I can finally breathe. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Zed has always been so kind to me, and he's always been there. I wish he had been the one I fell for instead of Hardin. God, Tessa Zed moans, and I tug at his hair. I kiss him harder. Wait he says into my mouth, and I pull away slowly. What is this? He looks into my eyes. I I don't know? My voice is shaky, and I'm out of breath. Me, either I'm sorry I'm just emotional, and I've been going through a lot, and what you said to me just now made me I don't know, I shouldn't have done that. I look away from him, and climb off of his lap, getting back into the driver's seat. It's nothing to be sorry for I just don't want to get the wrong idea, you know? I just want to know what this means to you, he tells me. What does this mean to me? I don't think I can answer that, not yet. I, thought so, he says, his voice slightly angry. I just don't know it's fine. I get it. You still love him. It's only been nine days, said, I can't help it. I keep managing to make new messes, each one bigger than the last. I know, I'm not saying that you can or will stop loving him. I just don't want to be your rebound. I just started dating someone, I haven't dated anyone, since I met you, and I finally met Rebecca. Then, when I drove you home and saw the way you reacted to me dating someone, I started thinking I know I'm an idiot, but I started thinking you didn't want me to move on or something. I look away from his handsome face and stare out the window. You aren't my rebound I wanted to kiss you just now. I just don't know what I'm thinking or doing. Nothing's made sense to me for the last nine days, and I finally stopped thinking about him when I kissed you, and it felt amazing. I felt like I could do this. I could get over him, but I know that it's not fair for me to use you that way. I'm just confused and irrational. 
I'm sorry for making you cheat on your girlfriend, that wasn't my intention. I just, I don't expect you to move on so soon. I know how deep his claws are into you. He has no idea. Just tell me one thing, said says and I not. Tell me that you'll at least try to allow yourself to be happy. He hasn't even called you, not once. He's done so much shit to you and he hasn't even tried to fight for you. If that were me, I'd be fighting for you. I would have never let you go in the first place. He reaches across and tucks an errant lock of hair behind my ear. Tessa, I don't need an answer right now, I just need to know that you're ready to try to be happy. I know you aren't ready for any type of relationship with me, but maybe someday you will be. My mind is racing, my heart is racing and aching all at once, and the air has been sucked out of the car. I want to tell him, that I can try, and I will try to allow myself this, but the words won't come. That small smile, that Hardin has on his face in the mornings, when I finally get him to wake up after complaining about my alarm clock, the way his raspy morning voice says my name, the way he tries to force me to stay in bed with him, and I end up squealing and running from the room, the way he likes his coffee black just like me, the way I love him more than anything in the entire world and I wish he could be different. I wish he could be exactly the same, only different, it doesn't make sense to me, and I know it won't make sense to anyone else, but that's the way it is. I wish I didn't love him as much as I do. I wish he hadn't made me fall in love with him. I get it. It's okay, said says, and he tries his best to smile but fails miserably. I'm sorry I say, and mean it more than he could ever know. He climbs out of the car, and shuts the door behind him, and I'm left alone, again. Fuck. I scream and hit my hands against the steering wheel, reminding me of Hardin once again. Chapter 85. Hardin. I wake up soaked in my own sweat again. I had forgotten how miserable it was to wake up this way nearly every night. I had thought the sleepless nights were a thing of the past, but now the past is haunting me yet again. I glance at the clock, it's 6 in the morning. I need sleep, real sleep. Uninterrupted sleep. I need her, I need Tess. Maybe if I close my eyes, and pretend that she's here, I'll be able to go back to sleep I close my eyes and try to imagine her head on my chest as I lie on my back. I try to remember the way her hair always smells like vanilla, the way she breathes heavily in her sleep. For a moment I feel her, feel her warm skin against my bare chest I'm officially going fucking crazy. Fuck. Tomorrow will be better, it has to be. I've been thinking, that for the last 10 days now. If I could just see her one more time, it wouldn't be so bad. Just once. If I saw her smile one more time, I could live with myself for letting her go. Will she be at Christian's party tomorrow? Seems pretty likely I stare at the ceiling and try to imagine what she'd be wearing if she was to go. Would she wear the white dress that she knows I love so much? Will her hair be curled and tucked behind her ear or will she pull it back? Will she wear makeup even though she doesn't need to? God damn it. I sit up and get out of bed. There is no way I can go back to sleep. When I get downstairs, Mike is sitting at the kitchen table, reading the paper. Good morning, Hardin, he says to me. Hey, I mumble back and pour myself a cup of coffee. Your mum is still asleep. You don't say I roll my eyes. Your mum is really happy to have you here. Yeah, sure. I've been a dick the entire time. Yeah, that's true. But she was glad to have you open up to her. She's always been so worried about you until she met Tessa. Then she wasn't so worried anymore. Well, guess she'll have to be worried again. I sigh. Why is he trying to have a fucking heart to heart with me at 6 in the fucking morning? I wanted to bring something to your attention, he says and turns to me. Okay I eye him. Harden, I love your mom, and I intend to marry her. I spit my coffee back into my cup. Marry her? Are you mad? He raises a brow. And why would my intention to marry her be mad? I don't know she's already been married, and you're our neighbor her neighbor. I can take care of her the way she should have been taken care of her entire life. If you don't approve, I'm sorry, but I thought I'd let you know that when the time is right, I'll be asking her to spend her life with me, officially. 
I don't know what to say to this man, the man who has lived next door to me my entire life, the man who I've never seen angry, not even once. He loves her, I can tell, but this is too weird for me to comprehend right now. Okay then okay then he echoes back and then looks behind me. My mum walks into the kitchen with her robe wrapped tight around her and her hair in a mess on her head. What are you doing up, Hardin? Are you going back home? She asks. No, I couldn't sleep. And this is home, I tell her, and take another drink of coffee. This is my home. She sleepily replies. Chapter 86. Tessa. I'm getting sucked back in, back under. The memories that I shared with Hardin tug at my feet attempting to pull me under the water. I roll the windows down in an attempt to get some air. Zed is so sweet to me, he's understanding and kind. He's dealt with a lot for me, and I've always brushed him aside. If I could just stop being foolish, I could try with him. I can't even imagine being in a relationship right now, or really anytime soon. But maybe with time I could. I don't want Zed to break up with Rebecca because of me, if I can't give him an answer, or even a hint of an answer. As I drive back to Landon's house, I'm more confused than ever. If I could just talk to Hardin, just see him once more, I could get closure. If I could hear him say that he doesn't care, if he would be cruel to me just one last time, I could give Zed the chance, give myself the chance. Before I can stop myself, I grab my phone and press the button that I've been avoiding since day four. If he ignores me, I can move on. We are officially over, if he doesn't answer my call. If he tells me that he's sorry and that we can work on it, no. I put the phone back on the seat. I've come too far to call him again, to break down again. But I need to know. The line goes straight to voicemail. Harden the words leave my lips at a frantic rate. Harden it's Tessa. I well, I need to talk to you. I'm in my car and I'm so confused I begin to cry. Why haven't you even tried to contact me? You just let me leave, and here I am pathetically calling you and crying into your voicemail. I need to know what happened to us. Why was this time different? Why didn't we fight it out? Why didn't you fight for me? I deserve to be happy, Hardin, I sob and hang the phone up. Why did I just do that? Why did I break down and call him? I'm such an idiot. He's probably going to listen to it and laugh. He'll probably let whatever girl he's hooking up with listen to the message, and they'll laugh, and laugh at my expense. I pull into a deserted parking lot to gather my thoughts, before getting into another accident. I stare at the phone, and breathe in and out in order to stop crying. Twenty minutes go by, and he still hasn't returned my call, or even texted me. Why am I sitting in a parking lot at ten at night crying and calling him? I fought myself for the last nine days to get myself to be strong, yet here I am falling apart, again. I can't let this happen. I pull out of the parking lot and drive back to Zed's apartment. Hardin is obviously too busy to be bothered with me, and Zed is here, honest and always here for me. I park next to his truck and take a deep breath. I have to think of myself first, and what I want. As I race up the stairs to Zed's door. I'm at peace with myself. I bang on the door, shifting back and forth waiting for it to open. What if I'm too late, and he doesn't answer the door? I'll get what I deserve, I suppose. I should have known better than to kiss him in the middle of all of this. When the door opens I nearly stop breathing. Zed is wearing only black gym shorts, his ink chest exposed. Tessa? He gapes, clearly surprised. I, I don't know what I can give you but I want to try, I tell him. He runs his hand over his black hair and takes a deep breath. He's going to reject me, I know it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have come I can't handle any more rejection. I turn toward the stairs and take two at a time before a hand hooks my arm and said turns me around to face him. He doesn't say anything at all. He just takes my hand in his and leads me back up the stairs and inside his apartment. Zed is calm so quiet and understanding as we sit on his couch, him on one side and me on the other. He's completely different from what I'm used to with Hardin. When I don't want to talk, he doesn't push me to talk. When I can't think of an explanation for my actions, he doesn't call me out. And when I tell him that I'm not comfortable sleeping in his bed with him, 
He brings me the softest blanket and a somewhat clean pillow, and lays them on his couch. The next morning when I wake up, my neck is killing me. Zed's old couch isn't the most comfortable, but I slept well, considering. Hey, he says when he walks into the living room. Hey. I smile. Did you sleep okay, he asks me, and I nod. Zed was incredible last night. He didn't even blink when I asked to sleep on the couch. He listened to me talk about Hardin, and how it had all gone wrong. He told me how he cares for Rebecca, but now doesn't know what to do, because he's always thought about me, even after meeting her. I felt guilty for the first hour, while crying to him, but as the night went on, the tears turned to smiles, which shifted to laughs. My stomach literally hurt from laughing about stupid memories from our childhoods by the time we decided to go to bed. It's nearly 2 in the afternoon now, the latest I think I've ever slept, but that's what happens when you stay up until 7 in the morning. Yes, do you? I stand and fold the blanket he lent me. I vaguely remember him draping it over me while I drifted off to sleep. Same. He grins and sits on the couch. His hair is wet and his skin is glistening like he just got out of the shower. Where should I put this? I ask him, referring to the blanket. Wherever, you didn't have to fold it. He laughs. My mind goes to the closet in the apartment, and how Hardin shoves random things in there, just to drive me insane. Do you have anything going on today? I ask him. I work this morning, so no. Already? Yeah, from 9 to noon. He smiles. I basically only went in to fix my truck. I forgot that Zed works as a mechanic. I don't really know much about him at all. Except that he has pretty good stamina if he can sleep two hours and then work like that. Environmental studies prodigy by day, grease monkey by night? I tease, and he chuckles. Something like that, what are your plans? I don't know. I need to get something to wear to my boss's dinner party tomorrow. For a moment I think about asking Zed to come along, but that would be wrong. I'd never do that, it would make everyone uncomfortable, including myself. Zed and I had come to an agreement that we weren't going to push anything. We're just going to spend time together and see where it goes. He isn't going to push me to move on from Hardin. We both know that I need more time before I can consider dating anyone. I have too much to figure out, like finding somewhere to live, for starters. I can come along if you want. Or maybe we could see a movie later, he asks nervously. Yeah, either one is fine. I smile and check my phone. No missed calls. No text messages. No voicemails. Zed and I end up ordering pizza and hanging out for the majority of the day until I finally leave to go back to Landon's to take a shower. On my way back I stop by the mall right before it closes and happen upon the perfect red dress with a square neckline. It rests just above my knees. It's not too conservative, but not too revealing either. By the time I get back to Landon's, there is a note on the counter next to a plate of food that Karen put aside for me. Her and Ken went to a movie and will be back soon, it says. I'm relieved to have the place to myself, even though when they're there, I don't really notice because the house is so large. I take a shower and put on pajamas before lying down and forcing myself to catch up on my sleep. My dreams shift back and forth between green and golden-eyed boys. Chapter 87. Tessa. 11 days. It's been 11 days since I've heard from Hardin, and it hasn't been easy. But Zed's company has surely helped. Tonight is the dinner party at Christian's, and all day I've become increasingly afraid that being around the familiar faces there will remind me of Hardin and knock at the walls that I've been building. All it will take is one small crack, and I'll no longer be protected. Finally, when it's time to go, I take a deep breath and check myself one last time in the mirror. My hair is the same way it always is, down and curled in loose waves, but my makeup is darker than usual. I slide Hardin's bracelet over my wrist. Even though I know I shouldn't be wearing it, I feel naked without it. It's such a part of me now, the way he is was. The dress looks even better today than it did yesterday, and I'm grateful that I've gained back the few pounds that I lost during the first few days of barely eating. I just want it back the way it was before. 
And I just want to see you back at my front door the music plays as I grab my small clutch purse. After one more beat, I pull the buds out of my ears and place them inside. When I meet Karen and Ken downstairs, they're dressed to a tee. Karen is in a long blue and white pattern gown, and Ken is wearing a suit and tie. You look so lovely, I say to her, and her cheeks flush. Thank you, dear, so do you. She beams. She is so sweet. I'm going to miss seeing her, and Ken so often, when I have to leave. I was thinking, that sometime this week we could go out to the greenhouse and work a little, she asks me as we walk to the car, my nude heels clanking loudly on the concrete driveway. I would love to, I tell her, and climb into the back of their Volvo. This will be so much fun. We haven't been to a party like this in a while. Karen takes Ken's hand in hers, and places it on her lap as he pulls out of the driveway. Their affection doesn't make me envious, it reminds me that people can actually be good to each other. Landon will be home from New York late tonight. I'll be picking him up at 2 a.m., Karen says excitedly. I can't wait for him to be back, I say. And I really mean it, I've missed my best friend, his words of wisdom, and his warm smile. Christian Vance's house is exactly how I had imagined it would be. Extremely modern in style, the entire structure is. Nearly transparent, beams and glass appearing to be the only thing securing it to the hill. Every decoration and detail is styled to blend into a perfect theme throughout the entire interior. It's amazing, and reminds me of a museum in the way that nothing in it looks like it's even been touched before. Kimberly greets us at the front door. Thank you guys, so much for coming, she says, pulling me into her arms. Thank you for inviting us. Ken shakes Kristen's hand. Congratulations on the big move. I lose my breath at the sight of the water just out the back windows. Now I understand why most of the house is glass, the house sits on a large lake. The water outside seems endless, and the setting sun makes the whole panorama even more breathtaking as it reflects off the lake, nearly blinding me. That the house is on a hill, and the yard is slightly sloped, creates the illusion that you're floating on top of the water. Everyone's in here. Kimberly leads us to their dining room, which, like the rest of the house, is perfect. None of this is my style, I prefer more old-fashioned decor, but Vance's place really is exquisite. Two elongated, rectangular dinner tables fill the space, each full of multicolored flowers and small bowls with floating candles inside for each play setting. The napkins are folded into the shape of flowers, a silver ring holding them in place. It's beautiful. So elegant and colorful, it looks like something straight from a magazine. Kimberly really has gone all out for this party. Trevor is sitting at the table closest to the window along with a few other faces I recognize from the office, including Crystal from marketing and her soon-to-be husband. Smith is seated two chairs down and has his face buried in some sort of handheld video game. You look beautiful. Trevor smiles at me and rises from his seat to greet Ken and Karen. Thank you. How are you? I ask. His tie is the exact same shade of blue as his eyes, which are bright and beaming. Great, ready for the big move. I bet. I say, but I'm really thinking, if only I were able to move to Seattle now Trevor, it's nice to see you. Ken shakes his hand, and I look down when I feel a slight tug at my dress. Hi, Smith, how are you? I ask the little boy with shining green eyes. Okay. He shrugs. Then, in a quiet voice, he asks, where's your Harden? I don't know what else to say, and the way Smith called him my Harden stirs something in me. The stone wall is already beginning to chip away, and I've only been here for 10 minutes. He's, um he's not here right now. He's coming, though. No, I'm sorry. I don't think he is, honey. Oh. It's a terrible lie in one that anyone who knows Hardin would see through, but I tell the little guy, but he did say to tell you hello, and I ruffle his hair a little. Now Hardin has me lying to children. Great. Smith half smiles, and sits back down at the table. Okay. I like your Hardin. Me too, I want to tell him, but he's not mine. Within 15 minutes, 20 more people arrive, and Christian has turned on his super high-tech stereo system. With only a click of a button, a soft piano melody spreads through the house. 
young men in white-collared shirts begin to circle the room with trays of appetizers, and I help myself to something that looks like a small piece of bread topped with tomatoes and sauce. The Seattle office is breathtaking, you should see it, Christian says to a small group of us. It's right on the water. It's two times larger than our office here. I can't believe I'm finally expanding. I try to appear as interested as I can as a waiter hands me a glass of white wine. Well, I am interested, I'm just distracted. Distracted by the mention of Hardin and the idea of Seattle. As I stare out the glass wall at the water, I imagine Hardin and me moving into an apartment together amid the excitement of a new city, a new place, and new people. We would make new friends and start a new life there, together. Hardin would work for Vance again and he'd brag all day and night about how he makes more money than me, and I would fight him to be allowed to pay the cable bill. Tessa? I'm brought out of my pointless daydream by the sound of Trevor's voice. Sorry I stutter and realize it's just the two of us now, and he's beginning or finishing a story that I wasn't even aware he was telling. As I was saying, my apartment is close to the new building and right in the middle of downtown, you should see the view. He smiles. The Seattle skyline is so beautiful, especially at night. I smile and nod. I bet it is. I bet it really really is. Chapter 88. Harden. What the fuck am I doing? I keep pacing back and forth. This was a stupid fucking idea to begin with. I kick a stone across the driveway. What am I expecting to happen, that she'll run into my arms and forgive me for all the shit I have done to her? She'll suddenly believe that I didn't sleep with Carly? I look up at Vance's gorgeous house. Tessa probably isn't even in there, and I'll look like an idiot showing up uninvited. Actually, I'll look like a dumbass either way. I should just leave. Besides, this shirt is fucking itchy, and I hate dressing up. It's only a black button-up shirt, but still. Seeing my father's car, I walk up the driveway a little bit and look inside. In the back seat, is that hideous purse that Tessa brings along to every single function she attends. So she's inside, she's in there. My empty stomach flutters at the idea of seeing her, of being close to her. What would I even say? I don't know. I have to explain how my days have been complete hell since I left for England and how I need her, I need her more than anything. I have to tell her that I'm an asshole and I can't believe that I fucked up the one good thing in my life her. She's everything to me, she always will be. I'll just go inside and get her to leave with me so we can talk, I'm nervous, fuck am I nervous. I'm going to throw up. No. But if there were food in my stomach I'm sure I would. I know I look like complete shit, I wonder if she does. Not that she ever could, but has it been as hard for her as it's been for me? I finally reach the front door, but then turn back around. I hate being around people as it is, and there are at least 15 cars in this driveway. Everyone will stare at me, and I'll look like a goddamned fool, which is exactly what I am. Before I can talk myself out of it, I spin around and quickly ring the doorbell. This is for Tessa. This is for her, I keep reminding myself when Kim opens the door with a surprised smile. Harden? I didn't know you'd be here she says. I can tell she's trying her hardest to be polite. But there's an anger coming to the surface, probably because she'll feel defensive of Tessa. Yeah me either I reply. Then a new emotion pity. It seeps into her eyes when she takes in my appearance, which is probably even worse than I imagine, since I just got off the plane and came straight here. Welcome inside, it's freezing out she offers and waves me inside. For a moment I'm stunned by the way Vance's house is decorated like a fucking work of art. It doesn't even look like anyone lives here. It's cool and all, but I like older things, not so modern art. We're just getting ready to eat, she tells me as I follow her into a dining room with glass walls. And that's when I see her. My heart stops, and a pressure lands on my chest that is so overwhelming it nearly chokes me. As she listens to someone telling her a story or something, she smiles and slides her hand across her forehead to push her hair back. The reflection of the setting sun behind her makes her glow, literally, and I can't move. I hear her laugh, and for the first time in 10 days I can breathe. I've missed her so much, and she looks phenomenal, she always does, but the red dress she's wearing, 
and the sun hitting her skin, the smile on her face, why is she smiling and laughing? Shouldn't she be crying, and shouldn't she look like hell? She giggles again, and my eyes finally discern who she's talking to, who's making her forget me. Fucking Trevor. I hate that bastard so fucking much, I could walk over there, and throw him through that glass window, and no one would be able to stop me. Why the fuck is he always around her? He's a fucking twit, and I'm going to fucking kill him. No. I need to calm down. If I hurt him right now, Tessa will never listen to me. I close my eyes for a few seconds, and talk myself down. If I stay calm she'll listen, and she'll leave here with me, so we can go home, where I'll beg for her forgiveness, and she'll tell me she still loves me, and we'll make love, and everything will be okay. I continue to watch her. She looks animated as she begins to tell a story. The hand that isn't holding the glass of wine moves around as she talks and smiles. My heart races as I spot the bracelet on her wrist. She's still wearing it, she's still wearing it. That's a good sign. It has to be. Fucking Trevor watches her intently, his expression holding an adoration for her that makes my blood boil. He looks like a lovesick puppy, and she's feeding right into it. Has she moved on already? With him? It would break me, if she did, but I couldn't blame her, really. I haven't returned her calls. I haven't even bothered to purchase a new phone yet. She probably thinks I don't care, that I've moved on already too. My mind travels back to that quiet street in England, to Natalie's swollen belly, to Elijah's adoring smile for his fiancée. Trevor is looking at Tessa that same way. Trevor is her Elijah. He's her second chance to have what she deserves. The realization hits me like a ton of bricks. I need to leave. I have to get out of here and leave her alone. It now makes sense to me why I ran into Natalie that day. I saw the girl I hurt tremendously, so I wouldn't make the same mistake again with Tessa. I have to leave. I have to get out of here before she sees me. But the moment I admit this to myself, she looks up and her eyes meet mine. Her smile vanishes, and the glass of wine slips from her hand and shatters on the hardwood floor. Everyone turns to look at her, but she stays focused on me. I break eye contact and see Trevor looking at her, confused but ready to spring into action to help her. Tessa blinks a few times, and her eyes travel to the floor. I'm so sorry, she says frantically, and bends down to try to gather the pieces of broken glass. Oh please, it's okay. I'll grab a broom and some paper towels, Kimberly calls and hurries off. I need to get the fuck out of here. I turn, ready to run. And nearly trip over a little person. I look down and see Smith, who's staring at me blankly. Thought you weren't coming, he says. I shake my head and pat him on the head. Yeah, I was just leaving. Why? Because I shouldn't be here, I tell him and look over my shoulder. Trevor has grabbed the little brush from Kimberly and is helping Tessa gather the shards of glass and toss them into a small bag. There has to be some symbolism behind this, behind watching him help her pick up the pieces. Fucking metaphors. I don't like it either. Smith groans, and I look back at him and nod. Stay, he asks innocently. Hopefully. I look back and forth between Tessa and the kid. I don't feel as annoyed with the little guy as I once did. I don't think I have the energy to be annoyed with him. A hand suddenly falls on my shoulder. You should listen to him, Christian says and squeezes a little. At least stay until after dinner. Kim has put a lot of effort into tonight, he adds with a warm smile. I look over to where his girlfriend in her simple black dress wipes a towel across the mess Tessa made because of me. And of course, Tessa is right beside her, apologizing more than she probably needs to. Fine, I agree and give Christian a nod. If I can make it through this dinner, I can make it through anything. I'll just swallow the pain, that comes from watching Tessa be so complacent without me. She appeared unaffected until she saw me, and then, when she did, sadness took over her beautiful face. I lack the same, act like she isn't killing me with every blink of her eyes. If she's under the impression that I don't care, she'll be free to move on and finally be treated the way that she deserves. Kimberly finishes cleaning up right as one of the waiters rings a little dinner bell. Well, now that the show's over, 
it's time to eat, she says with a laugh, and sweeps her arms to guide people to the tables. I follow Christian to a table, then pick a seat at random, not paying attention to where Tessa and her friend are. I play with the silverware a little, until my father and Karen come over and greet me. I didn't expect to see you here, Hardin, my father says. I sigh as Karen takes the seat next to me. Everyone keeps saying that, I say. I don't allow myself to look up from the table to find Tessa. Have you spoken to her? Karen asks me almost inaudibly. No, I reply. I stare at the small printed swirl pattern on the tablecloth and wait for the waiters to bring out the food. Chickens, whole fucking chickens are brought out on large platters. Bowl after bowl of sides are placed in a row along the table. Finally, I can't help but look up to find her. I look to my left, but then I'm surprised to find that she's sitting almost directly across from me next to fucking Trevor, of course. She's absentmindedly pushing an asparagus pier across her plate repeatedly. I know she doesn't like them, but she's too polite to not eat something someone else has prepared for her. I watch her as she closes her eyes and brings the vegetable to her mouth, and I almost smile when she tries her best to not appear disgusted as she washes the bite down with water, then pats her lips with a napkin. She catches me staring at her, and I immediately look away. I can see the pain behind her blue-gray eyes. Pain that I've caused. Pain that will only stop if I stay away from her and let her move on. All our unspoken words float in the air between us, and she directs her attention back to her plate. I don't look up again during the sumptuous meal, of which I barely take five bites. Even when I hear Trevor talking to Tessa about Seattle, I keep my eyes averted. For the first time in my life I wish I was someone else. I would give anything to be Trevor, to be able to make her happy, and not hurt her. Throughout the meal, Tessa answers his questions briefly, and I know she's thankful, when Karen begins to talk about Landon, and his longtime girlfriend in New York. The sounds of a fork against a glass ring through the room, and Christian stands up and says, if I could have everyone's attention please he taps it one more time, then chuckles and adds, I better stop, before I break it giving Tessa a whimsical look. Her cheeks flush, and I have to press my hands down against my thighs to hold myself in the chair and not tackle him to the ground for embarrassing her. I know he's only teasing, but it's still a dick move. Thank you all so much for coming, it means the world to me to have everyone that I love here with us. I am beyond proud of the work that everyone in this room has done, and I couldn't possibly be making this move without you all you the best team I could ever hope for. Who knows, maybe next year we'll even be opening an office in Los Angeles, or even New York, so I can drive you all batshit crazy with the planning again. He nods at his own joke, but beams with ambition. Don't get ahead of yourself, Kimberly says and smacks his butt. And you, especially you Kimberly. I wouldn't be anywhere without you. His tone changes drastically, altering the air in the room as well. He takes her hands in his and moves to stand in front of where she sits. After Rose died, I was living in complete darkness. The days came and went in a blur, and I never thought I would be happy again. I didn't think I was capable of loving anyone else. I had accepted that it would just be Smith and me. Then one day this bubbly blonde crashes into my office, 10 minutes late for her interview, and with the most hideous coffee stain on her white blouse, and that was it for me. I was captivated by her spirit and your energy. He turns to Kimberly. You gave me life when I had none left in me. No one could ever replace Rose, and you knew that. But you didn't try to replace her, you welcomed her memory and helped me get my life back. I only wish I had met you sooner, so I wasn't miserable for so long first. He laughs a little, trying to draw back on the emotionality of the moment, but he fails. I love you, Kimberly more than anything, and I would love to spend the rest of my life repaying you for what you have given me. He bends down on one knee. Is this some kind of fucking joke? Is everyone I know suddenly deciding to get married, or is this some fucked up cosmic joke on me? This wasn't a celebration party, this was an engagement party. He smiles at the object of his affection. Well, that is, if you say yes. Kimberly squeals and begins to cry. I look away from them as he practically screams her acceptance. 
I can't help but look at Tessa as she claps her hands to her face and wipes at her tears. I know she's doing her best to smile for her friend in this joyful moment, to pretend they're tears of happiness. But really, I can tell that she's only pretending. She's overwhelmed, having just listened to her friend hear everything that she once wished she would hear from me. Chapter 89. Tessa. My chest aches as I watch Christian wrap his arms around Kimberly and lift her off the floor in a loving embrace. I'm so happy for her, I really am. It's just that it's hard to sit and watch someone get something that you wanted, no matter how happy you are for them. I would never want to take even an ounce of her happiness away, but it's hard to watch as he kisses both her cheeks and slides a gorgeous diamond ring onto her finger. I stand up from my seat, hoping that no one will notice my absence. I make it to the living room before the tears fall in earnest. I knew this would happen, I knew I would break. If he wasn't here, I could handle it, but it's too surreal, too painful, to have him here. He came here to taunt me, he had to have. Why else come, but not speak to me at all? It doesn't make sense, he's avoided me for the past 10 days, then he shows up here, where he knew I would be. I shouldn't have come. I should have at least driven myself, so I could leave right now. Zed won't be here until Zed. Zed is coming to pick me up at 8. Looking at a sleek grandfather clock, I see it's 7.30 already. Hardin will kill him, literally, if he sees him here. Or maybe he won't, maybe he doesn't care at all. I find the restroom and close the door behind me. It takes me a moment to realize the light switch is a touch screen panel on the wall. This house is too damn high tech for me. I was absolutely humiliated when I dropped the Winogliss. Hardin seemed so indifferent, like he could care less about me being here, or how awkward for me his presence really is. Has it even been hard for him? Did he spend days crying and lying in bed the way I did? I have no way to know, and he isn't giving off the heartbroken impression. Breathe, Tessa. You have to breathe. Ignore the knife lodged in your chest. I wipe my eyes and look at my reflection. My makeup hasn't smudged, thank goodness, and my hair is still perfectly curled. My cheeks are slightly flushed, but in a way it makes me look better, more lively. When I open the door, Trevor is leaning against the wall with concern clear in his features. Are you okay? You ran out of there pretty fast. He takes a step toward me. Yeah I just needed some air, I lie. A stupid lie, at that. It doesn't even make sense to rush to the bathroom for air. Lucky for me, Trevor is a gentleman and would never call me out on my lie the way Hardin would. Okay, they're serving dessert now, if you're still hungry, he says and escorts me back down the hallway. Not really, but I'll have some, I respond. I practice regulating my breathing and find that it helps settle me some. I'm thinking about what to do about the impending Zed Hardin meetup when I hear Smith's small voice coming from a room we pass by. How do you know, he asks in his little clinical manner. Because I know everything, Hardin replies. Hardin? Hanging out with Smith? I stop and wave Trevor on. Trevor, why don't you go on? I am I'm going to talk to Smith. He looks at me questioningly. Are you sure I can wait, he offers. No, I'm fine. I politely dismiss him. He gives a little nod and wanders off. Leaving me free to impolitely eavesdrop. Smith says something I don't get, and Harding replies, I do, though, I know everything. His voice is as calm as ever. I lean against the wall next to the door as Smith asks, will she die? No, man. What is with you always thinking everyone's going to die? I don't know, the little boy tells him. Well, it's not true. Not everyone dies. Who dies? Not everyone. But who? Harden. Smith presses. People, bad people, I guess. And old people. And sick people, oh, and sad people sometimes. Like your pretty girl? My heart races. No. She won't. She's not sad, Harden says, and I put my hand over my mouth. Yeah, ha. Huh. No, she's not. She's happy, and she won't die. Neither will Kimberly. How do you know? I already told you how I know, it's because I know everything. His tone has changed since the mention of my name. I hear a dismissive little laugh from Smith. No, you don't. 
Are you okay now? Or are you going to cry more? Hardin asks. Don't tease. Sorry, are you done crying, though? Yeah. Good. Good. Don't mock me. It's rude, Hardin says. You're rude. So are you. Are you sure you're only five? Hardin asks. Which is exactly what I've always wanted to ask the kid. Smith is so mature for his age, but I guess he has to be, considering what he's been through. Pretty sure. Do you want to play? Smith asks him. No, I don't. Why? Why do you ask so many questions? You remind. Tessa? Kimberly's voice startles me, and I nearly scream. She puts a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Sorry. Have you seen Smith? He took off, and Hardin, of all people, went after him. She looks confused yet touched by that. Um, no. I hurry down the hallway, to avoid the humiliation of being caught by Hardin. I know he heard Kimberly call my name. When I get back to the dining room, I approach the small group that Christian is speaking with and tell him how much I appreciate him inviting me and I congratulate him on his engagement. Kimberly appears moments later and I hug her goodbye before doing the same with Karen and Ken. I check my phone, 10 minutes till 8. Hardin is occupied with Smith and obviously has no intention of speaking to me and that's fine. That's what I need. I don't need him to apologize and tell me that he's been miserable without me. I don't need him to hold me and tell me we'll find a way to work this out, to fix everything he has broken. I don't need that. He won't do it anyway, so it's pointless to need it. It hurts less when I don't need it. By the time I reach the end of the driveway, I'm freezing. I should have worn a jacket, it's the end of January, and it's just begun to snow. I don't know what I was thinking. I hope Zed gets here soon. The icy wind is unforgiving as it whips my hair around and makes me shiver. I wrap my arms around me in an attempt to keep warm. Tess. I look up, and for a moment I think I'm imagining the boy in all black walking toward me in the snow. What are you doing? Hardin asks me, drawing even closer. I'm leaving. Oh he rubs his hand over the back of his neck like he always does. I stay quiet. How are you, he asks and I'm baffled. How am I? I turn to look at him. I try to keep my cool as he stares at me with a completely neutral expression. Yeah I mean, are you you know, okay? Should I tell him the truth or lie how are you? I ask, my teeth chattering. I ask first, he responds. This is not how I had envisioned our first encounter. I'm not entirely sure what I thought would happen, but this isn't it. I thought he would be cursing me out, and we would be in a screaming match. Standing in a snow-dusted driveway, asking each other how we're doing, is the last thing I imagined. The lanterns hanging in the trees lining the driveway make Hardin appear to be glowing, like an angel. Obviously an illusion. I'm fine, I lie. He looks me up and down slowly, making my stomach leap and my heart pound. I see that. His voice carries over the wind. And now. How are you? I want him to say he's doing terribly. But he doesn't. Same. Fine. Quickly I ask, why haven't you called me? Maybe this will evoke some emotion from him. I he looks at me, and then down at his hands, before running them through his snow-covered hair. I was busy. His answer is the wrecking ball that takes down the rest of my wall. Anger overpowers the bone-crushing hurt that is threatening to take over at any moment. You were busy? Yeah I was busy. Wow. Wow what, he asks. You were busy? Do you know what I've been going through the last 11 days? It's been hell, and I felt pain, that I didn't know I could endure, and at times I didn't think I could. I kept waiting waiting like a fucking idiot. I scream. You don't know what I've been doing either. You always think you know everything, but you don't know shit, he yells back, and I walk to the very end of the driveway. He's going to lose it, when he sees who's picking me up. Where the hell is said, anyway? It's five minutes after eight. Tell me, then. Tell me what was more important than fighting for me, Hardin. I wipe the tears from under my eyes and beg myself to stop crying. I'm so sick of crying all the time. Chapter 90. Hardin. When she starts to cry, it becomes much harder to keep a neutral face. 
I don't know what would happen if I told her that I've been through hell, too, that I felt pain that I wasn't sure I could endure either. I think she'd run into my arms and tell me it's okay. She was listening to me talk to Smith, I know she was. She said, just the way the obnoxious little boy claimed, but I know how this ends. If she forgives me, I'll just come up with some other fucked up thing to do to her next. It's always been that way, and I don't know how to stop it. The only option here is giving her a chance to be with someone much better for her. I believe that deep fucking down she wants someone who is more like her. Someone with no tattoos, no piercings. Someone without a fucked up childhood and anger issues. She thinks that she loves me now, but one day, when I do something even more fucked up than I already have, she'll regret ever speaking to me. The more I look at her crying in this driveway with the snow falling down around her, the more I know that I'm not good for her. I'm Tom and she's Daisy. Lovely Daisy, who is corrupted by Tom, and she's never the same after. If I beg for her forgiveness right now, on my knees, in this snowy driveway, she'll be the awful Daisy for eternity, all of her innocence, will be gone, and she'll end up hating me, and herself. If Tom had left Daisy at the first moment of her uncertainty, she could have had a life with the man she was destined to be with, a man that would have treated her the way she deserved to be treated. It's none of your concern really, is it? I say and watch as my words rattle her to her core. She should be inside with Trevor, or back home with Noah. Not with me. I'm no Darcy, and she deserves one. I can't change for her. I will find a way to live without her, just the way she must live without me. How could you even say that? After everything we've been through, you just toss me aside and don't even have the decency to give me an explanation, she cries. Headlights appear at the end of the dark street, casting her into silhouette and creating new shadows across the land. I'm doing this for you. I want to shout. But I don't. I just shrug my shoulders. Her mouth opens, then closes as a truck stops in front of us. That truck what is he doing here? I croak. Picking me up, she says with such offhand finality, that the news nearly brings me to my knees. Why would why is he what the fuck? I pace back and forth. I had been trying to push her away from me, and trying to let her move on, so she could be with someone like herself, not fucking Zed, out of all people. Have you have you been seeing, that piece of shit? I say, glaring at her. I'm aware of how frantic I sound, but I don't give a shit as I step past Tessa and walk over to where his truck is stopped. Get out of the goddamn car. I shout. Zed surprises me by climbing out and leaving the engine running. He's such a fucking idiot. Are you alright? He has the nerve to ask her. I get up in Zed's face. I knew it. I knew you were waiting for your moment to swoop in and make a move on her. Did you think I wouldn't find out? He looks at her, and she looks at him. Holy fucking shit, this is really happening. Leave him alone, Harden, she insists and I snap. One of my hands wraps around the collar of Zed's jacket. The other connects with his jaw. Tessa screams, but it's barely a whisper, lost in the wind and my rage. Zed stumbles back, holding his jaw. But then he quickly steps back up toward me. He and his death wish. Did you think I wasn't going to find out? I fucking told you to stay away from her. I move to hit him again, but this time he blocks me and manages to nail me right in the jaw. Anger mixes with the adrenaline of being in a fight for the first time in weeks. I've missed this feeling, the energy flowing through my bloodstream, getting me high. I hit him in the ribs. This time he falls to the ground, and I'm on top of him in seconds, pummeling him again and again. I'll give him credit, he's managed to get in a few punches. But he has no way to overpower me. I was there and you weren't. He eggs me on. Stop it. Stop, Harden. Tessa pulls on my arm, and reflexively I knock her backward onto the driveway. Immediately, I snap out of my rage, and turn to her as she backs away on her hands and knees, and then stands, and puts her arms straight out, as if to ward me off. What the fuck did I just do? Don't you fucking go near her. Zed yells behind me. He's by her side in no time, and she's staring at him, not bothering to even look at me. Tessa I didn't mean to do that. I didn't know it was you, I swear. You know how I see red, when I'm angry I'm so sorry. As she stares straight through me. 
Can we just go please? She asks calmly, and my heart leaps until I realize that she's talking to him, to Zed. How the fuck did this happen? Yes, of course. Zed drapes his jacket over her shoulders and opens the passenger seat of his truck for her and helps her inside. Tessa I call again, but she doesn't acknowledge me as she buries her face in her hands and her body is racked with sobs. I point a finger at Zed and threaten, this isn't over. He nods and goes around to the driver's side before looking at me again. I think it is, actually. He smirks and climbs inside his truck. Chapter 91. Tessa. I'm so sorry that he pushed you like that, Zed tells me as I swipe the warm cloth across his busted cheek. The skin is cut and just won't stop bleeding. No, it's not your fault. I'm sorry you keep getting dragged into this. I sign dip the cloth back into his sink. He had offered to take me back to Landon's instead of following our previous plan of seeing a movie, but I didn't want to go back to Landon's. I didn't want Hardin to show up there and cause a scene he's probably there destroying Ken and Karen's entire house right now. God, I hope not. It's cool. I know how he is, I'm just glad he didn't hurt you. Well, worse than he did. He sighs. I'm going to apply pressure to this, so it may hurt, I warn him. He closes his eyes as I press the cloth to his skin. The cut is deep, it looks like it may scar, even. I hope not. Zed's face is too perfect to have a scar like this, and I certainly don't want to be the cause of it. Done, I say, and he smiles despite the fact that his mouth is swollen as well. Why am I always cleaning up wounds? Thank you. He smiles again as I rinse off the bloodstained towel. I'll send you a bill, I tease. Are you sure you're okay, though? You hit the ground pretty hard. Yeah, I'm a little sore, but I'm fine. The events from tonight took a drastic turn for the worse when Hardin followed me outside. I had a feeling he wasn't too hurt by me leaving him, but I thought he would be more affected than he was. He said he was busy and that's why he hadn't called me. Even though I thought he wouldn't care as much as I did, I thought he loved me enough to care a little. Instead, he acted as if nothing had even happened, as if we were friends having a casual conversation. That is, until he saw Zed and lost it. If anything, I thought seeing Trevor would anger him, and he would try to start a fight in front of everyone, but he couldn't have cared less. Which is kind of strange. Regardless of how brokenhearted I am, I know Hardin wouldn't hurt me purposely, but this is the second time something like this has happened. The first time I was quick to excuse his behavior. I was the one who convinced him to go to his father's for Christmas, and he just couldn't handle it. Tonight was his fault, he shouldn't even have been there. Are you hungry? Zed asks me as we leave his small bathroom for the living room. No, I already ate at the party, I say. My voice is still hoarse from my excessive embarrassing sobbing on the way to Zed's apartment. Okay, we don't have much anyway, but I could order you something if you want, so just let me know, if you change your mind. Thank you. Zed is always so incredibly sweet to me. My roommate will be here in a little while, but he won't bother us. He'll probably crash, as soon as he gets in. I really am sorry, that this keeps happening, Zed. Don't apologize. Like I said, I'm just glad I was there for you. Hardin seemed pretty angry when I got there. We were already fighting. I roll my eyes and take a seat on the couch, wincing from the soreness. Go figure. All of my bruises and cuts from my automobile accident just healed, and now I'm going to have another, from Hardin. The back of my dress is dirty and ruined, and my shoes are scuffed down the sides. Hardin really does ruin everything that he comes in contact with. Do you need some clothes to sleep in? Zed asks, handing me the old blanket I slept with a few nights ago. I'm slightly apprehensive about borrowing Zed's clothes. That's something I share with Hardin, and I've never worn anyone else's clothing. I think Molly has some stuff here in my roommate's room. I know that's probably awkward he half smiles. But I'm sure they're better than sleeping in that dress. Molly is much thinner than me, and I almost laugh. I can't fit in her clothes, but thank you for thinking I could. Zed seems to be confused by my answer. His cluelessness is adorable. Well, I have some clothes you can wear, he offers, and I nod, before I allow myself to overthink it. 
I can wear whoever's stuff I want, Hardin doesn't own me, he didn't even care enough to try to explain himself to me. Zed disappears into his bedroom and returns moments later with his hands full of clothing. I grabbed a few different things, I don't know what you like. There's something behind his tone that makes me think he'd really like to get to that stage with me. The one where you know what the other likes. The stage I'm at with Hardin. Was at. Whatever. I grab a blue t-shirt and a pair of plaid pajama bottoms. I'm not picky. I give him a thankful smile before I go into the bathroom to change. To my horror, the plaid thing that I thought was pants is in fact a pair of boxers. Zed's boxers. Oh god. I unzip my dress and pull the large t-shirt over my head before considering what to do about the boxers. The shirt is smaller than Hardin's shirts are. It barely hits the top of my thigh and it doesn't smell like Hardin. Of course it doesn't. It's not Hardin's. It smells like laundry soap with the smallest hint of cigarette smoke. The smell is nice somehow, though not as nice as the familiar scent of the boy that I miss. I pull the boxers up my legs and look down. They aren't too short. In fact, they're sort of baggy, tighter than Hardin's would be, but not too tight. I'll just walk to the couch and cover myself with a blanket as fast as I can. I'm incredibly embarrassed to be wearing them but it would be even more embarrassing to make a big deal out of it after. Everything Zed has been through tonight because of me. His poor face holds the proof of Hardin's anger, a big bloody reminder of why Hardin and I would never work. Hardin only cares for himself, and the only reason he lost it when he saw Zed is his pride. He doesn't want me, but he doesn't want me to be with anyone else either. I leave my dress folded on the bathroom floor, it's already dirty and ruined anyway. I'll try the dry cleaners, but I'm not sure if it can be saved. I really love that dress too, and it cost me a decent amount of money, money that I sorely need once I find my own apartment. I walk as fast as I can, but when I reach the living room, Zed is standing next to the television. His eyes go white as they rake up and down my body. I uh, I was putting something I was putting, trying to find a movie to watch. Or something for you to watch, I mean. He stammers, and I sit on the couch and pull the blanket over me. His fumbled words and the look in his eyes make him appear younger and more vulnerable than usual. He laughs nervously. Sorry, I was trying to say I was turning the TV on so you could watch it. Thank you, I say and smile as he takes a seat on the other end of the couch. He rests his elbows on his knees and stares forward. If you don't want to keep hanging out with me, I understand, I say to break the silence. He turns to face me. What? No, don't think that. His eyes pour into mine. Don't worry about me, I can handle it. A couple beatings aren't going to make me stay away from you. The only thing that will is if you tell me to. You want me to, then I will. But until you tell me to go, I'm here. I don't want you to go, that is. I just don't know what to do about Hardin. I don't want him to hurt you, again, I tell him. He's a pretty violent guy. I know what to expect, I guess. Don't worry about me, though. I just hope that, after seeing who he really is tonight, you'll distance yourself from him. Sadness creeps in at the thought, but I say, I am, I definitely am. He doesn't care anyway, so why should I? You shouldn't. You're too good for him, anyway. You always have been, he assures. I scoot closer to him on the couch, and he lifts my blanket and gets under it too, before pressing a button to turn on the television. I love the ease between us. He doesn't say things just for the single purpose of pissing me off, and he doesn't hurt my feelings on purpose. Are you tired? I ask him after a bit. Nah, you? A little. Go to sleep, then. I can go to my room. No. Actually. You can stay out here until I fall asleep? My tone is more asking than telling. He looks at me, relief and happiness in his eyes. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Chapter 92. Harden. I pound my fist onto the trunk of my car and scream to let out some of my anger. How did that happen? How did I push her to the ground? He knew what was going to happen the moment he stepped out of that truck, and he ended up getting his ass beat again. I know Tessa, she's going to pity him, 
and blame herself for his ass beating, and then she's going to think she owes him something. Fuck. I scream even louder. What are you yelling about? Christian appears in the snowy driveway. I look over at him and roll my eyes. Nothing. The only person that I will ever love just left with the person I despise the most in the world. Vance looks at me with amusement for a second. Obviously something, he quips and takes a big sip of his drink. I don't really feel like having a fucking heart to heart right now, I snap. Such a coincidence, neither do I. I'm just trying to figure out why there's an asshole screaming in my driveway, he says with a smile. I nearly laugh at that. Fuck off. I take it, she didn't accept your apology? Who says I gave an apology, or a reason to need one? Because you're you, and on top of that, you're a man he salutes me, and downs the rest of what's in his glass. We always have to apologize first. It's the way it is. Letting out a hard breath, I say, yeah, well, she doesn't want my apology. Every woman wants an apology. I can't get the image of her looking to Zed for comfort out of my mind. Not mine, not her. Fine, 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 Christian says, flapping his hands down. Are you coming back inside? No, I don't know. I shake the snow from my hair and push it back off my forehead. Ken, your dad and Karen are getting ready to leave. And I give a shit why? I reply, and he chuckles. Your language never ceases to surprise me. I give him a grin. What? Do you curse just as much as I do? Exactly. He puts his arm around my shoulders. And I surprise myself by letting him lead me back inside. Chapter 93. Tessa. I can't sleep. I've been waking up every 30 minutes to check my phone to see if Hardin's tried to contact me. Of course there's nothing. I check my alarm again. I have classes tomorrow, so Zed's going to take me back to Landon's early enough to get ready and get to school on time. When I try to close my eyes again, my mind races, remembering the way the dream Hardin pleaded with me to come home. Hearing it, dream or not, still kills me. After tossing and turning on the small couch, I decide to do what I should have done at the beginning of the night. When I push Zed's bedroom door open, I immediately hear his light snoring. He's shirtless and lying on his stomach, with his arms folded under his head. I'm waging an internal war with myself as he stirs in his sleep. Tessa? He sits up. Are you okay? He sounds panicked. Yeah, I'm sorry for waking you up I was just wondering if maybe I could sleep in here? I ask timidly. He looks at me for a second before saying, yeah, of course. Shifting his body a little, he makes sure there is plenty of room for me to lie down. I try to ignore the fact that his bed doesn't have a sheet on it. He's a college boy, after all, not everyone is as neat as I am. He slides a pillow across the mattress, and I lie down next to him, the distance between us being less than a foot. Do you want to talk about anything, he asks. Do I? I wonder. But I say, no, not tonight. I can't make out the mess that is inside of my head. Is there anything I can do? His voice is so soft in the darkness. Scoo closer? I request, and he does just that. I'm nervous as I turn on my side to face him. His hand moves up to my cheek, and he rubs his thumb back and forth. His touch is warm and gentle. I'm glad you're here with me, and not him, said whispers. Me too, I respond, having no clue if I mean it or not. Chapter 94. Hardin. Landon's developed quite the attitude since the night he attempted to assault me. He threw a tantrum at the airport when he saw me standing at the baggage claim and realized I was here to pick him up instead of his mum. Karen had agreed to allow me to pick her son up, maybe because she didn't want to go out. After Vance's party, or maybe because she pities me. I'm not sure either way, but I'm glad she did. For his part, Landon is flat out annoyed, claiming that I'm the biggest asshole he's ever met, and refusing to get into the car with me at first. It took me nearly 20 minutes to convince my lovely stepbrother that riding with me had to be better than walking 30 miles in the middle of the night. After a few miles of driving in silence, I pick up the conversation where we agree to let it die back in the terminal. Well, I'm here, Landon, and I need you to tell me what I should do. I'm split. 
right down the fucking middle. Between what and what, he asks. Between leaving here and going back home to England to ensure that Tessa has the life that she deserves and driving over to Zed's and fucking murdering him. Where does she fit into the latter of those? I look at him and shrug. I would make her come with me after I murder him. That's the problem here. Do you think you can make her do whatever you want and look where that got you? I didn't mean it like that. I just mean I know he's right, so I don't even try to finish that thought. But she's with said, I mean, how did it even happen? I can't fucking see straight thinking about it. I groan, rubbing my temples. Well, maybe I should drive, then? Landon is so fucking annoying. Hardin, she stayed the night with him Friday and hung out with him all day Saturday. My vision literally goes black. What? So she's just so she's dating him? Landon traces a pattern on the window. I don't know if she's dating him, but I do know that when I talked to her Saturday she said she'd laughed for the first time since you deserted her. I scoff. She doesn't even know him. I can't believe this shit's happening. Not to be a jerk, but you can't ignore the irony of the fact that you were so obsessed with her being with someone like her, but she ends up seeing someone just like you, Landon says. He's nothing like me, I say and try to focus on the road, before I end up breaking down in front of Landon. I stay quiet the rest of the ride to my father's house. Did she cry at all? I finally ask when I pull up to the driveway. Landon looks at me incredulously. Yes, for a week straight. Then he shakes his head. Man, you have no idea what you've done to her, and you didn't even care. You're still only thinking about yourself. How can you say that, when I've done this for her? I've kept myself away, so that she can move on. I don't deserve her, you told me that yourself, remember? I do, and I still mean it. But I also think she should be the one, to decide what she deserves, he says with a huff, and gets out of my car. Jace takes a puff from his joint, then looks at it intensely. I haven't really been doing shit lately, just hanging out. Tristan barely comes around anymore. He's stuck up Steph's ass. Hmm, I murmur. I take a sip from my beer and look around his shit apartment. I don't even know why I came here in the first place, but I didn't know where else to go. I'm sure as hell not going back to that apartment tonight. I can't believe Tessa is with said, what the actual fuck. And Landon wouldn't call Tessa and trick her into coming back to my father's house no matter how many times I try to force him to. He's a dick. Still, I have to admit I admire his loyalty, but not when it stands in the way of what I want. Landon said I should allow Tessa to make the choice whether she wants to be with me or not, but I know what she'd choose. Well, I thought I did. I was completely blindsided by Zed picking her up and having spent almost the entire weekend with her. What's going on with you? Jace asks me his pot smoke blowing right in my face. Nothing. I must say I was pretty surprised to have you show up at my door tonight after what happened the last time I saw you, he reminds me. You know why I'm here. Do I? He taunts. Tessa and said. I know you know about it. Tessa? Tessa Young and Zed Evans? He smiles. Tell me. He needs to wipe that goddamn smile off his face. After I meet him with silence, he shrugs. I don't know anything about it, honest. He takes another drag, and small flakes of the white paper fall onto his lap, not that he seems to notice. You're never honest. I take another sip. Yes, I am. So they're fucking? He raises a brow. I nearly choke on my breath from his question. Don't fucking go there. Have you seen them together? I breathe in and out slowly. Nope, I don't know anything about them. Jace puts his joint in the ashtray. I thought he was dating some high school chick. I stare at a pile of dirty laundry in the corner of the room. So did I. So she ditched you for Zed? Don't mock me, I'm not in the mood. You came here asking questions. I'm not mocking you, Jay sneers. I heard they were together on Friday, and I wanted to know who was there. I don't know. I wasn't, though. Don't you two live together or some shit? He takes his wand of hipster glasses off and places them on the table. Yes. Why do you think I'm so pissed about this shit with said? Well, you know how he's after what you 
I know. I hate Jays, I really do. And said. Couldn't Tessa have chosen Trevor to move on with? Holy shit, I never thought I would consider her being with Trevor a positive. I roll my eyes and fight the urge to knock Jays through his coffee table. This is getting me nowhere, none of this is, the drinking, the anger, none of it. You're sure you don't know shit, because if I find out you do, I will kill you. You know that, don't you? I threaten, meaning every word. Yes, dude, we all know how psychotic you are over this chick. Stop being such a dick. I'm just warning you, I tell him, and he rolls his eyes. Why did I start hanging out with him in the first place? He's a fucking slime ball, and I should have let our so-called friendship end with me beating his ass. Jace gets up and does a slow stretch. Well, man, I'm going to bed now. It's 4 a.m. You can crash on the couch if you want. No, I'm good, I say and head for the door. It's 4 in the morning, and it's cold outside, but I'll never be able to sleep knowing she's with said. At his apartment. What if he's touching her? What if he spent this entire weekend touching her? Would she fuck him to spite me? No, I know her better than that. This is a girl who still blushes each time I slide her panties down her thighs. However, Zed can be pretty convincing, and he could have her drinking. I know she can't handle alcohol, two drinks and she starts cursing like a sailor and trying to unfasten my belt. Fuck, if he gets her drunk and touches her, I make a U-turn right in the middle of the intersection and hope there are no cops around, especially since they'll smell the beer on my breath. Fuck this staying away from her shit. I may have been a dick to her, and I have treated her like shit, but Zed is far worse than me. I love her more than he, or any other man, possibly could. I know what I had now. I know what the fuck I had to lose, and now that I've lost it, I need it back. He can't have her, no one can. No one except me. God damn it. Why didn't I just apologize to her at the party? That's what I should have done. I should have dropped to my knees in front of everyone and begged for her to forgive me and we could be in our bed together right now. Instead I argued with her and accidentally knocked her over when I was so mad I couldn't tell who was who. Zed is a fucking prick. Who the fuck does he think he is, picking her up from that party? Is he serious? My anger is getting the best of me again. I need to calm down before I get there. If I stay calm she'll speak to me, I hope. By the time I get to Zed's door, it's 4.30 in the morning. I stop and stand still for a few minutes in an attempt to calm myself down. Finally, I knock and wait impatiently. Just as I'm about to turn my knocking into pounding, the door swings open, revealing Tyler, Zed's roommate, who I've spoken to a few times when they had parties here. Scott? What's up, man? He slurs. Where's Zed? I push past him not wasting any time. He rubs his eyes. Dude, you know it's like 5 in the morning, right? Nope, only 4.30. Where but then I notice the folded up blanket on the couch. Neatly folded, a tacit indicator. It takes a moment for my brain to connect to the fact that the couch is empty. Where is she, if she's not on the couch? Bile rises in my throat and I lose the ability to breathe for the hundredth time tonight. I storm across the apartment, leaving a confused Tyler in my wake. When I open Zed's bedroom, it's dark, near pitch black. I pull my phone from my pocket and switch on its flashlight. Tessa's blonde hair is sprawled out on the pillow under her, and Zed is shirtless. Oh my fucking god. When I find the light switch and flip it on, Tessa stirs and rolls over onto her side. My boot hits the edge of a desk with a loud thud. She scrunches her eyes shut and then opens them slightly to find the source of disruption. I try to think of what to say as I process the scene in front of me. Tess and Zed in bed, together. Harden, she whines, and a frown takes over as she appears to wake up. She looks over to Zed before she looks up at me, clearly shocked. What what are you doing here, she asks frantically. No, no. What are you doing here? In bed with him? I try my best not to shout, my fingernails digging into my palm. If she fucked him, I'm done, completely and utterly fucking done with her. How did you get in here, she asks, her face full of sadness. Tyler let me in. You're in his bed? 
How could you be in his bed? Zed rolls over onto his back and wipes his eyes, then he pops up and sits ready, eyeing me where I stand in the doorway. What the hell are you doing in my room, he demands. Don't, Harden. Stay still. I have to stay fucking still, or someone will end up in the hospital. The someone is said, but if I'm going to get her away from him, I have to stay as calm as possible. I came to get you, Tessa. Let's go, I say and reach my hand out, even though I'm across the room. Her brow furrows. Excuse me? Here comes the infamous Tessa attitude you can't just come to my apartment and tell her to leave. Zed moves to get out of bed, and I see he's only in loose gym shorts that sag down to show his boxers. I don't think I can stay calm. I can, and I just did. Tessa I wait for her to get off the bed, but she doesn't move. I'm not going anywhere with you, Hardin, she tells me. You heard her, man. She's not coming with you, Zed taunts me. I wouldn't start that shit right now. I'm trying with every fucking fiber of my being not to do anything that I'll regret, so just shut the fuck up, I growl. He throws his arms wide in challenge to me. It's my apartment, my bedroom at that, and she doesn't want to go with you, so she's not. If you want to fight me, then go ahead. But I'm not going to force her to go, if she doesn't want to. When he finishes, he gives her the fakest concerned expression I've ever seen. I let out an evil laugh. That's the plan, though, isn't it? Do you get me mad enough, so I beat your ass, and she'll feel bad for you, and I'll be the monster who everyone is afraid of? Don't buy into this shit, Tessa. I shout. I can't stand the fact that she's still sitting in his bed, and even more I can't stand the fact that I can't beat the shit out of him for it, because that's exactly what he wants. Tessa sighs. Just go. Tessa, listen to me. He isn't who you think he is, he's not Mr. Fucking Innocent. And how's that, she challenges. Because well, I don't know, yet. But I know he's using you for something. He just wants to fuck you, you know this, I tell her, struggling to keep hold of my emotions. No, he doesn't. She says it flatly, but I can see she's getting angry. Dude, you should just go, she doesn't want to leave. You're making a fool out of yourself. When the words leave his busted lip, my body starts to shake. I have way too much anger that I need to let out. I warned you to shut the fuck up. Tessa, stop being difficult and let's go. We need to talk. It's the middle of the night, and you, she begins, but I cut her off. Please, Tessa. Her expression changes as she hears my words, and I have no idea why. No, Hardin, you can't just come here and demand that I leave with you. Zed shrugs and nonchalantly says, don't make me call the cops, Hardin. And that's it. I take a step toward him, but Tessa jumps up off the bed and steps between us. Don't. Not again, she begs, her eyes staring directly into mine. Then come with me. You can't trust him, I tell her. Zed scoffs. And she can trust you? You blew it, just face it. She deserves better than you, and if you would just let her be happy, let her be happy? Would you? As if you actually want a relationship with her? I know you only want to get in her pants. That's not true. I care about her, and I could treat her better than you ever did, he shouts back in my face, and Tessa presses her palms against my chest. I know it's stupid, but I can't help but revel in her touch, the way her hands feel against me. I haven't felt her touch in so long. Both of you stop please. Harden, you have to go. I'm not leaving. Tessa. You're too naive, he could give a shit about you. I yell in her face. She doesn't even blink. And you do? You were too busy to call me for 11 days. He was there when you weren't, and if he shouts, and continues shouting something at me, but right then I notice her clothing. Is she? She isn't I take a step back to find out for sure. Are those what the hell are you wearing? I stammer and begin to pace back and forth. She looks down seeming to have forgotten her attire. Are those his fucking clothes? I nearly scream. My voice cracks and I tug at my hair. Hard and she tries to speak. Indeed they are said answers for her. If she's wearing his clothes did you fuck him? I croak, tears threatening to spill at any given moment. 
Her eyes go wide. No. Of course not. Tell me the truth right fucking now, Tessa. Did you fuck him? I already answered you. She shouts back. Zed stands back and watches with a worried look on his bruised face. I should have done more damage. Did you touch him? Oh my fucking god. Did he touch you? I'm frantic and I don't give a shit. I can't handle this. If he touched her, I couldn't stand it, I wouldn't be able to. I turn to Zed before either of them can answer. If you touched her at all, I swear to fucking god I don't give a shit if. She's here or not, I'll. She steps between us again, and I see fear in her eyes. Get out of my apartment now, or I'm calling the police, Zed threatens me. The police? Do you think I give a flying, I'll go. Tessa's voice is soft in the middle of the chaos. What? Zed and I say in unison. I'll go with you, Hardin, only because I know you won't leave unless I do. And I feel relief. Well, a little. I don't give a fuck why she's coming, only that she is. Zed turns to her, almost pleading. Tessa, you don't have to go. I can call the cops. You don't have to leave with him. This is what he does. He controls you by frightening you and everyone around you. You're not wrong, she sighs. But I'm exhausted and it's five in the morning and we do have stuff to talk about. So this is the easiest way. It doesn't have to. She's coming with me. I tell him and Tessa shoots me a glare that would surely kill me dead if it could. Said, let me just call you tomorrow. I'm so sorry that he came here, she tells him softly, and at last he nods, finally understanding that I've won. He's fucking sulking, and she better not fall for it. Actually, I'm really surprised she's agreeing to come with me so easily, but she does know me better than anyone else, so she was right when she said I wouldn't leave until she came with me. Don't apologize. Be careful, and if you need anything, don't hesitate for a moment to call me, he says to her. It must suck to be a little bitch and not be able to do shit about me showing up at his apartment in the middle of the night and taking Tessa with me. Tessa doesn't speak a word as she walks out of his bedroom and stalks to the bathroom across the hall. Don't come near her again. I've already warned you before and you haven't gotten the hint yet, I say when I reach the bedroom door. Zed glowers at me. And if it weren't for Tessa calling my name from the living room, I would have snapped his neck. If you hurt her, I swear to God I will make it the last time, he says loud enough for her to hear as we walk through the door and out into the snow. Chapter 95. Hardin. High heels and his fucking boxers. It's a ridiculous pairing, but I assume she doesn't have other shoes, which may be a sign that she didn't plan on staying the night. But, still, she did and I'm fucking disgusted that she was in his bed. I can't stand to look at her in those clothes. This is the first time that I don't want to look at her. Her red dress is in her arms, and I know she's freezing. I try to give her my coat, but she just snapped at me to shut up and take her to my father's place. I don't even mind her anger toward me. In fact, I welcome it. I'm so relieved and so damn happy that she left with me at all. She could curse me out the entire drive, and I'd enjoy every word falling from her full lips. I'm angry too, angry at her for running to Zed. Angry at myself for trying to push her away. I have so much to tell you, I say as we pull onto my father's street. With an icy glare she holds her ground, though. I don't want to hear it. You had your chance to talk to me for the past 11 days. Just hear me out, okay? I beg. Why now, she asks and looks out the window. Because because I miss you, I admit. Do you miss me? Do you mean you're jealous that I was with Zed? You didn't miss me until he picked me up tonight. You are fueled by jealousy, not love. That's not true. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Okay, it does have a lot to do with it, but I do miss her, regardless. You didn't talk to me all evening, then you came outside and told me you were too busy to talk to me. That's not what you do when you miss someone, she points out. I was lying. I lift my hands into the air. Do you? Lying? No way. Her eyes close, and she shakes her head slowly. God, she's feisty tonight. I take a deep breath to make sure that I don't say something that will make this worse. I don't have a phone, for starters, and I went home to England. Her head snaps to look at me. 
Do you what? I went to England to clear my head. I didn't know what else to do, I explain. Tessa turns down the volume on the radio and crosses her arms in front of her chest. You didn't answer my calls. I know. I ignored them, and I'm so sorry for that. I wanted to call you back, but I couldn't bring myself to, and then I got drunk and broke my phone. Is that supposed to make me feel better? No, I just want you to be happy, Tessa. She doesn't say anything. She looks out the window again, and I reach for her hand, but she pulls away. Don't, she says. Tess no Harden. You can't just show up 11 days later and hold my hand. I'm sick of going around in circles with you. I'm finally at a point where I can go an hour without crying, then you pop up and try to pull me back under. You've done this to me since the day I met you, and I'm sick of giving in to it. If you cared about me, you would have explained yourself. She's trying her hardest not to cry, I can tell. I'm trying to explain myself now, I remind her, my annoyance growing as I pull into my father's driveway. She tries to open the door, but I hit the locks. You weren't seriously trying to lock me in the car with you. You already basically forced me to leave Zed's house. What's wrong with you? She begins to shout. I'm not trying to lock you in the car. I am, though. However, in my defense, she's stubborn and doesn't like to listen to anything I have to say. She presses the unlock button and climbs out. Tessa. God damn it, Tessa, just listen to me. I shout into the wind. You keep telling me to listen, but you haven't been saying anything. Because you won't shut up long enough for me to. We always end up in a screaming match. I need to let her yell at me and just take it, otherwise I'll say something I regret. I want to bring up Zed in the fact that she's in his fucking clothes, but I have to keep my temper under control. I'm sorry, okay, just give me two minutes to talk without interrupting me. Please? She surprises me by nodding and crossing her arms to wait for me to speak. The snow is really coming down, and I know she's freezing, but I have to talk to her now, or she may change her mind. I went to England after you didn't come back that night. I was so pissed off at you that I couldn't see straight. You were being so damn difficult, and I just she turns away from me and starts to walk up the snowy driveway toward the house. Damn it. I'm shit at apologies. I know it's not your fault. I lied to you and I'm sorry. I shout, hoping she'll turn around. She does. This isn't only about you lying, Harden. There is so much more than that. Tessa says. Then tell me please. It's about you not treating me the way I should be treated. I never come first with you, it's always about you. Your friends, your parties, your future. I don't get to make any decisions about anything, and you made me feel like a fool when you said I was being crazy about marriage. You weren't listening to me, it isn't about marriage, it's about the fact that you haven't even thought of what I want for myself and my future. And yes, I would like to be married someday, not anytime soon, but I need security. So stop acting like I'm into this relationship more than you. Let's not forget that you were drunk and stayed out all night with another woman. She's out of breath by the time she finishes speaking, and I take a few steps toward her. She's right, and I know she is. I just don't know what to do about it. I know, I thought if it were just the two of us there, you would I stutter. I would what? Harden? Her teeth are chattering, and her nose is red from the cold. I pick at the dried scabs on my knuckles. I don't know how to say what I feel without sounding like the world's most selfish asshole. You would be less likely to leave me, I admit and wait for her horrified response. It doesn't come. Instead she begins to cry. I don't know what else I could have done to show you how much I loved you, Harden. I kept coming back every time you hurt me. I moved in with you, and I forgave you for every unthinkable thing you did to me, I gave up my relationship with my mother for you, and you're still so insecure. She quickly wipes her tears away. I'm not insecure, I tell her. See, she cries. That's why this would never work. You always let your ego get in the way. I don't let my ego get in the way of shit. I snap. If anything, my ego is pretty fucked right now because I just found you in Zed's bed. You're really going to go there right now? Hell, yes I am, 
you're acting like I stop myself as she flinches from the words that she knows will follow. I know it's not her fault that he got under her skin he's good at that but, it still fucking hurts me that she stayed with him. She throws her arms out in challenge. Go ahead, Harden, call me names. She's the most infuriating woman in the entire world, but fuck if I don't love her even at her most difficult. When I stay silent and try to tamp down my anger, she clicks her tongue. Well, that's some improvement, but I'm going inside. I'm cold and have to be up in an hour to get ready for school. She walks toward the house, and I follow her up the driveway, waiting for her to remember that she left her purse in my father's car, which is here, but locked. After looking at the door for a moment, she says, mostly to herself, I assume, I'll have to call Landon. I don't have a key. You can come home, I suggest. You know that's not a good idea. Why not? We just need to figure this all out. I pull up my hair with one hand. Together, I clarify. Together? Tessa repeats, half laughing. Yes, together. I've missed you so much. I've been through hell without you and I hope you've missed me too. You should have reached out to me. I'm exhausted by this, we do this too much. We can do it, though. You're too good for me, and I fucking know it. But please, Tessa, I'll do anything. I can't go through another day like this. Chapter 96. Tessa. My heart aches as the words leave his mouth. He's too good at this. Do you always do this? You say the same things over and over, Yet nothing changes, I say. You're right, he admits, looking directly into my eyes. It's true. Yeah, I'll admit the first few days I was just so mad, and I didn't want to be anywhere near you, because you were overreacting, but then, as I began to realize this could be it, it terrified me. I know I haven't treated you the way I should have, I don't know how to love anyone other than myself, Tess. I'm trying as hard as I can, okay. I haven't been trying as hard I could. But I will from now on, I swear it. I look at him. I've heard those words too many times. You know you've said that before. I know, but this time I mean it. After I saw Natalie, I, Natalie? My stomach drops. You saw her? Does she still love him? Or hate him? Has he truly ruined her entire life? Yeah, I saw her, and I spoke to her. She's pregnant. Oh God. I haven't seen her in years, Tessa, he says sarcastically, reading my mind. She's also engaged, and she's happy, and she told me that she forgives me, and was saying how she's happy to be getting married, because there's no greater honor or some shit, but it was really eye-opening for me. He steps toward me again. My legs and arms are numb from the cold air, and I'm furious at Hardin, more than furious. I'm enraged and heartbroken. He keeps going back and forth, and it's exhausting. Now he's here in front of me talking about marriage, and I don't know what to think. I shouldn't have even left with him. My mind was made up earlier, I would get over him, if it was the last thing I did. What are you saying? I ask. That now I realize how lucky I am to have you, to have you stick by me through all the shit I put you through. Well, you are. And you should have realized that before. I've always loved you more than you love me and, that's not true. I love you more than anyone has ever loved another person. I went through hell too, Tessa. I've been sick, literally, without you. I've barely eaten, I know I look like shit. I was doing this for you, so you could move on, he explains. That doesn't even make any sense. I push my damp hair away from my face. Yes, it does. It does make sense. I thought if I stayed out of your life, you could move on and be happy without me, with your own Elijah. Who's Elijah? What is he talking about? What? Oh, Natalie's fiancé. See, she found someone to love and marry her. You can too, he tells me. But the someone's not you is it? I ask him. A few seconds pass, and he doesn't say anything. His expression is puzzled and frantic as he tugs at his hair for the tenth time in the last hour. Slivers of orange and red light are beginning to appear behind the large houses on the block, and I need to get inside before everyone wakes up, and I have to shame walk past them in boxers and high heels. I didn't think so. I sigh, not allowing any more tears to be shed for him, not until I'm alone, 
at least. Hardin stands in front of me with a completely blank expression as I pull up Landon's number and ask him to open the door for me. I should have known that Hardin was only going to fight enough to get me out of Zed's apartment. Now that he actually has the perfect opportunity to tell me everything I need to hear, he's standing there in silence. Come on, it's freezing, Landon says and closes the door behind me. I don't want to push my problems on Landon right now. He only got home from New York a few hours ago, and I need to not be selfish. He grabs the blanket that hangs over the back of the chair and drapes it over my shoulders. Let's go upstairs before they get up, he suggests, and I nod. My entire body and mind are numb from the snow and harden. I glance at the clock as I follow Landon up the stairs. It's 10 till 6. I need to get into the shower in 10 minutes. It's going to be a long day. Landon opens the door to the room I've been staying in and turns the light on as I walk over to sit on the edge of the bed. Are you okay? Do you look like you're freezing? He says, and I nod. I'm grateful for him not asking what I'm wearing and why. How is New York? I ask but I know my voice comes out monotone and uninterested. The thing is, I am interested in my best friend's life, I just have no emotions left to show. He gives me a little look. Do you sure you want to talk about this right now? It can wait until coffee o'clock, you know. I'm sure, I say and force a smile. I'm used to this back and forth with Hardin. It still hurts, but I knew it was coming. It always does. I can't believe he went to England to get away from me. He said he had to clear his head, but I should be the one clearing mine. I shouldn't have stayed outside and talked to him for so long. I should have had him drive me here and come right inside the house instead of listening to him. The words he said only made me more confused. I thought for a moment he was going to say he does see and want a future with me, but when it came time for him to say just that, he let me walk away again. When he admitted, that he wanted to take me away to England, so I couldn't leave him, I should have run for the hills, but I know him too well. I know he doesn't believe he's worthy of anyone loving him, and I know that in his mind, that made sense to him. The problem is that's not a normal thing to do, he can't just expect me to give up everything and be trapped with him in England. We can't be there just because he's scared that if we're not, I'll leave him. He has a lot of things he needs to work out on his own, and so do I I love him, but I have to love myself more. It was nice, I loved it. Dakota's apartment is really awesome, and her roommate is really nice, Landon starts off by saying. And all I can think is that it must be so nice to have an uncomplicated relationship. Memories of Noah and me watching endless hours of movies flash through my mind, nothing was ever complicated with him. But maybe that's why it didn't last. Maybe that's why I love Hardin so much, because he challenges me, and we have so much passion between us that it nearly crushes us both. After he tells me some more details, I pick up on his excitement over New York City. So are you moving there? I ask. Yeah, I think I am. Not until the semester ends, but I really want to be near her. I miss her a lot, he tells me. I know you do. I'm happy for you, I really am. I'm sorry that you and Hardin don't be. It's done. I'm done. I have to be. Maybe I should come to New York with you. I smile, and his face lights up with the warm smile I adore so much. You could, you know. I always say this. I always say I'm done with Hardin, then I go back to him. It's an endless cycle. So in this moment, I make a decision, I'm going to talk to Christian Tuesday about Seattle. Really? I have to, I tell him, and he nods in agreement. I'm going to get dressed, so you can take a shower. I'll meet you downstairs when you're ready. I missed you so much. I stand and hug him as tight as I can. Tears spill down my cheeks, and he hugs me tighter. I'm sorry, I'm just a mess now. I have been since he came into my life, I cry and pull away. He frowns but doesn't say anything as he heads to the door. I gather my clothes in my arms and follow him into the hallway to head to the bathroom. Tessa? He says as he reaches his bedroom door. Yeah? Landon looks at me with great sympathy in his eyes. Just because he can't love you the way you want him to doesn't mean he doesn't love you with everything he has he says. What does that even mean? 
I process his words as I close the bathroom door and start the shower. Hardin loves me, I know he does, but he continues to make mistake after mistake. I continue to make the mistake of putting up with it. Does he love me with everything he has? Is that enough? As I pull Zed's t-shirt over my head, there's a knock at the door. Hang on, Landon, I need one second, I call and pull the shirt down to cover my stomach. But when I open the door, it's not Landon. It's Hardin, and his cheeks are stained with tears and his eyes are bloodshot. Hardin? His hand cups my neck, and he pulls me to him. His mouth moves against mine, before I can resist. Chapter 97 Hardin. I can taste my tears and the hesitation on her lips as I bring her body against mine. I press my palm against the small of her back and kiss her harder it's a feverish and purely emotional kiss, and I could pass out from the relief of feeling her mouth on mine. I know it won't be long before she pushes me away, so I take in every movement of her tongue, every barely audible gasp falling from her lips. All of the pain from the last 11 days nearly evaporates when her arms wrap around my waist, and in this moment, more than ever, I know that no matter how much we fight, we will always find a way back to each other. Always. After I watched her walk back into the house, I sat in my car for a second before finally growing some fucking balls and coming after her. I've let her slip away too many times, and I can't take the chance of this being the last day I see her. I lost it. I couldn't help, but cry as Landon closed the door behind her. I knew that I had to come after her, I had to fight for her, before someone else takes her away from me. I'll show her, that I can be who she wants me to be. Not completely, but I can show her, how much I love her, and that I won't allow her to walk away so easily, not anymore. Harden she says, and gently presses her hand against my chest, and pushes me back, breaking our kiss. Don't. Tessa, I beg her. I'm not ready for it to end yet. Hardin, you can't just kiss me and expect everything to be okay. Not this time, she whispers, and I fall to my knees in front of her. I know, I don't know why I let you walk away again, but I'm sorry. So sorry, baby, I tell her, hoping the use of the word will help my cause. I wrap my arms around her legs, and her hands move to my head, caressing and running her fingers through my hair. I know I always fuck everything up, and I know I can't treat you the way that I have been. I just love you so much that it overwhelms me, and I don't know what the fuck to do half the time, so I just say things on impulse and don't think of how the words affect you. I know I keep breaking your heart, but please please let me fix it. I'll put it back together, and I won't dare to break it again. I'm sorry, I'm always sorry. I know. I'll get a fucking shrink or something. I don't care, just I sob into her legs. I grab hold of the waistband of the boxers and slide them down. What are you she stops my hands. Please, just take them off. I can't stand you wearing them, please I won't touch you, just let me take them off, I beg, and she lifts her hands from mine, returning them to my hair as I slide the boxers to the floor, and she steps out of them. Her hand moves under my chin, to lift up my head. Her small fingers caress my cheek, then move up to wipe away the tears from my eyes. Her face holds a confused expression, and she watches me carefully, as if she's studying me. I don't understand you, she tells me, still swiping her thumb across my tear-stained cheeks. I don't either, I agree, and she frowns. I stay in this position, kneeling in front of her, begging for her to give me one last chance, even though I've blown through more chances than I deserve. I register that the bathroom has filled with steam, and her hair is sticking to her face, and moisture is beginning to pool on her skin. God, she's beautiful. We can't keep going back and forth, Hardin. It's not good for either of us. It's not going to be that way anymore. We can get through this. We've gotten through worse, and I know now how quickly I can lose you. I took you for granted, and I know that. I'm only asking for one more chance. I take her face between my hands. It's not that simple, she tells me. Her bottom lip begins to quiver, and I'm still trying to stop my tears. It's not supposed to be simple. It's not supposed to be this hard either. She begins to cry with me. Yes, yes, it is. 
It'll never be easy with us. We are who we are, but it won't always be this hard. We just have to learn to talk to each other without fighting every time. If we'd been able to have a conversation about the future, it wouldn't have turned into this big fucking mess. I tried, but you wouldn't have it, she reminds me. I know. I sigh. And that's something I have to learn. I'm a mess without you, Tessa. I'm nothing. I can't eat, sleep, or even breathe. I've been crying for days straight, and you know I don't cry. I just I need you. My voice is breaking and cracking, and I sound like a fucking idiot. Stand up. She hooks her arm under mine, to try to pull me up. Once I'm on my feet, I stand directly in front of her. My breath is ragged, and it's hard to breathe in here, with the steam filling every inch of the bathroom. Her eyes pour into mine as she takes in my confession. If it wasn't for the fact that I'm crying, she wouldn't believe me. I know she's battling with herself, I can tell by the look in her eyes. I've seen it before. I don't know if I can. We keep doing this over and over. I don't know if I can set myself up for it again. She looks down at the ground. I'm sorry. Hey, look at me, I plead and tilt her head up, so her eyes meet mine. She averts her eyes, though. No Harden. I need to get in the shower, I'm going to be late. I capture a single tear from just below her eye and nod. I know that I've put her through hell, and no one in their right mind would take me back again after the bet, the lies, and my constant need to fuck everything up. She's not like anyone else, though. She loves unconditionally, and she puts everything she has into loving me. Even now, when she's turning me away, I know she loves me. Just think about it, okay? I ask her. I'll give her space to think about it, but I'm not going to give up on her. I need her too fucking much. Please? I say when she doesn't respond. Okay, Tessa finally whispers. And my heart leaps. I'll show you, I'll show you how much I love you, and that this can work. Just don't give up on me yet, okay? I wrap my hand around the doorknob. She bites down on her bottom lip, and I let go of the knob, to close the small space between us. When I reach her, she looks up with cautious eyes. I want to kiss her lips again, to feel her arms wrapped around me, but instead I plant a single kiss on her cheek and step away from her. Okay, she repeats, and I head out of the door. It takes every bit of self-discipline I possess to walk out of the bathroom, especially when I turn around, and she's pulling the t-shirt over her head to expose her creamy skin, which I haven't laid eyes on in what seems like years. I shut the door behind me, and lean against the frame, closing my eyes to stop myself from crying again. Fuck. At least she said she'd think about it. She seemed so apprehensive, though, like it pained her to think of being with me again. I open my eyes, when Landon's bedroom door opens, and he steps into the hall wearing a white polo and khakis. Hey, he says to me as he slings his bag over his shoulder. Hey. Is he okay, he asks. No, but I hope she will be. Me too. She's stronger than she knows. I know she is. I use my shirt to wipe my eyes. I love her. I know you do, he says, which surprises me. I look up at him again. How do I show her that? What would you do? I ask him. The pain look flashes in his eyes, but quickly disappears before he answers. You just have to prove to her that you'll change for her. You have to treat her the way she deserves to be treated and give her the space she needs. It's not that easy to give her space, I tell him. I can't believe I'm talking to Landon about this shit, again. You have to, though, or she'll just fight back against you. Why don't you try to show her in an unsuffocating way that you'll fight for her? That's all she wants. She wants you to make an effort. An unsuffocating effort? I don't suffocate her. Okay, maybe I do, but I can't help it, there is no lukewarm for me, I either push her away or hold her too close. I don't know how to balance the two. Yeah, he says, like I wasn't being sarcastic. But since I need his help, I shake the attitude off. Could you explain what the hell you mean? Give me an example or something. Well, you could ask her out on a date. Have you guys ever even been on an actual date? He asks. Yeah, of course we have, I say quickly. Haven't we? Landon arches an eyebrow. When? 
Um well, we went to and there was this time we I'm drawing a blank year. Okay, so maybe we haven't, I conclude. Trevor would have taken her on dates. Has said. If he has, I swear to fucking okay, so ask her out. Not today, though, because that's too soon for even you two. What's that supposed to mean? I snap. Nothing, I'm just saying you need some space. Well, she does. Otherwise you're going to push her away even more than you already have. How long should I wait? A few days, at least. Try to act like the two of you just began dating, or you're trying to get her to date you. Basically try to make her fall in love with you again. You're saying that she doesn't love me anymore? I harshly remark. Landon rolls his eyes. No. Geez, would you stop with the pessimism all the time? I'm not a pessimist, I bark, defending myself. If anything, this is the most optimistic I've been in a long time. Okay you're an asshole, I tell my stepbrother. An asshole that you keep asking for relationship advice from, he brags with an annoying smile. Only because you're the only friend I have that has an actual relationship, and you happen to know Tessa better than anyone, except me, of course. His smile grows. You just called me your friend. What? No, I didn't. Yes, yes. You did, he says, clearly pleased. I didn't mean friend friend, I meant I don't know what the hell I meant, but it sure wasn't friend. Sure. He chuckles, and I hear the water turn off behind the door. He's not so bad, I guess, but I'll never tell him that. Should I ask to drive her to campus today? I follow him down the stairs. He shakes his head at me. What part of non-suffocating do you not get? I like you better when you kept your mouth shut. I liked you better when you well, I never liked you, he says, but I can tell he's teasing. I never thought he liked me, actually. I thought he hated me for the terrible things I've done to Tessa. But here he is, my only ally in this mess I made for myself. I reach out my arm and push him lightly, which makes him laugh, and I almost join him until I spot my father at the bottom of the stairs watching us like we're an act in a circus. What are you doing here, he asks and takes a drink from his coffee mug. I shrug. I brought her home well, here. Is this her home now? I hope not. Oh, my father says, and looks to Landon. Probably too pointedly, I say, it's fine, dad. I can bring her wherever I want to. You can stop trying to play protector, and remember which one of us is your actual child. Landon gives me a look as we walk downstairs, and the three of us walk into the kitchen. I grab some coffee, aware of Landon's eyes still on me. My dad grabs an apple from the wire fruit basket on the island and begins a fatherly lecture. Hardin, Tessa has become a part of this family in the last few months, and this is her only place to go when you, he trails off as Karen enters the kitchen. When I what? I ask. When you mess up. You don't even know what happened. I don't have to know the whole story, all I know, is she's the best thing that's ever happened to you, and I'm watching as you make the same mistakes, that I did with your mother. Is he fucking serious? I'm nothing like you. I love her, and I would do anything for her. She's everything to me, which is nothing like you and my mom. I slam the mug down, spilling coffee on the counter. Hard and Tessa's voice is behind me. Damn it. To my surprise Karen jumps to my defense. Ken, you leave the boy alone. He's doing his best. My father's eyes immediately soften as he turns to his wife. Then he looks back at me. I'm sorry, Hardin, I just worry about you. He sighs, and Karen rubs her hand up and down his back. It's fine, I say and look at Tessa standing in her jeans and WCU sweatshirt. She looks so innocently beautiful with her damp hair hanging around her makeup-free face. If Tessa hadn't appeared in the kitchen, I'd have told him how big of an asshole he is and how he needs to learn to mind his own goddamn business. I grab a paper towel and wipe it over the counter to clean up the pool of coffee on their expensive-ass granite countertop. Are you ready? Landon asks Tessa, and she nods, still staring at me. I really want to take her but I should go home and sleep or shower, lie on the bed and stare at the ceiling, clean the place hell, anything but sit here and chat with my father. Her eyes finally leave mine, and she leaves the room. When I hear the front door close, I let out a deep breath. 
As soon as I walk away from my father and Karen, I hear them start talking about me, of course.